There's no time. No. O'clock. Okay, and we are back. This is going to be a good show tonight. This is going to be a cannibal show. <laughs> and uh, it's going to have to do with cannibals in the Old West. It's almost yeah. kind of like in honor of Crussell and, you know, Bone Tomahawk. <laughs> What's on the list, Jenny? Yeah, we are going to do, uh, someone a long time ago requested that we do Alfred or Alfred Packer. He's known as both things. Uh, also known as the Colorado Cannibal. Mm -hmm. And I figured since we were doing that, I guess we would talk about the even more famous tale of frontier cannibalism. The good old Donner Party. Yeah. Ain't no party like a Donner Party. Which one are we going to do first? No one wants to go to a Donner Party. Uh, we're probably going to talk about Alfred Packer okay. first. And then we'll do the party. And then we'll do uh, the Donner We're Party. We're going to do the party. <laughs> yeah, like I said. Yeah. This is not a party anyone wants to get invited to. It's a horrible, horrible, horrible story. Uh, the Alfred Packer one is kind of uh, different in, in the sense that it's more ambiguous. We don't really know if he ended up eating people because he had to or just because he just kind of did it. You know what I mean? I know quite a bit about the Donner Party. I read a book about it a long time ago when I was a kid. I don't know how accurate it was. I've seen a few programs on it. Um, but the the Alfred guy, I've heard of him, but I don't know all the details. He's like, the guy that, you know, um, the, the guys that did South Park and they did that musical that was called Cannibal the Musical? Uh, that's, uh, that's about Alfred Packer. Okay. Like, it's based on his story. I think we talked about... Another cannibal, like that Scottish uh, cannibal clan, the Sawney Bean and his family, mm -hmm. that kind of, uh, that the Hills Have Eyes was based on. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, this guy is actually quite famous in Colorado. And uh, the best thing about this, or weirdest, I mean, you know, if you're into like dark humor and stuff, is that there's a whole shit ton of restaurants and cafeterias and stuff in Colorado that are named after him. Damn. From what I, from what <laughs> I I'm like, that's messed up, but also kind of funny. From what I remember, he was kind of like, uh, kind of like a mountain man slash gunfighter. And he was a prospector. Prospector, yeah. But he also carried, he also was heavily armed and I think he shot people too. If, if it's the same one I'm thinking of. They're not really sure. That, like I said, no one is entirely sure what happened out there on the expedition yeah. that they went on because he was the only one who returned. Yeah. He and got, he gave at least three different yeah, he got stories he got over the trouble. years like of what actually happened. Yeah. Uh, and I kind of suspect, you know, e even though he's almost kind of like, I think in Colorado, uh, you know, among certain segments of the population, I guess, he's kind of like, a folk hero or like kind of a local legend type of thing even though i'm pretty sure he just like straight up murdered people yeah probably it was it was guys that were with him i think yeah, it? yeah 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 but yeah so uh we'll get into that first and then uh, after that we'll talk about the donner party earlier today i was uh listening to last podcast on the left did a two-part uh series on the donner party that was hilarious but also horrifying and yeah. they uh they recommended a book i can't remember who wrote it but it was called oh shit um do to do to do something about indifferent stars or something like that but it sounded like a really kick-ass book and uh all three of them had read it and they kept like recommending it over and over because it was like really good but it was all about the donner party and it went like into exhaustive detail about like all the shit that happened and like all the families and everything so we'll get into that a little bit as well but before we do that, let's do a couple of brief shout outs. We have one new patron this week named the Mystery Gamer. Intriguing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I knew that is. All right. Thank you, Mystery Gamer. <laughs> so thank you very much yeah. uh, for being a patron. He's a Mystery uh, Gamer. Yeah, he's he's mysterious. It's mystery. What or game or he's she up could to. be mysterious. Yeah. I don't know. Playing he... some kind of mysterious ass game. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, uh, we always appreciate uh, you guys and your patronage. Uh, like I said, we're eventually going to do the whole YouTube membership thing as well. If you don't want to do Patreon, and if you'd like to contribute to the show, you'll be able to go through the YouTube membership thing. But like I said, uh, that might be a while before it uh, goes up. Uh, also, I think I mentioned these on probably on some of our sidetrack shows, but I know that we don't, you know, 
a lot of people, not as many people listen to those as uh, listen to these. So I wanted to give another shout out to uh, Eric for sending me uh, the book about the um, the Taliesin and whatever, the house. Uh, and also I wanted to thank Marcus again for sending us those four movies. Yeah, we already watched one of them. That's Chef Marcus. Chef Marcus. Chef Marcus. Yeah, uh, we watched one of them already. It's pretty good. It was the, um, what was it going it was the one about incarnate. the incarnate. Incarnate. That's yeah, right. The, about, the possession one. Yeah. It's with about, Aaron Eckhart. Kind of, imagine like. It was a Blumhouse movie. Yeah. Imagine Chuck Norris doing exorcisms. It's kind of like that. <laughs> Chuck Norris has a PI. His doing, demon ass kicking. It's a demon PI. I'm telling you, I, and I can't remember, God damn it, I can't remember the name of it. Because remember I told you like my ex-husband was like a huge Chuck Norris fan. So I, against my better judgment, I saw pretty much every movie that Chuck Norris ever made. There was one where it was like a religious one where he was like fighting the devil or went to hell or something like that. It's been like many years since I've seen it, but it had that type of... It must have been when Chuck went all religious. Yeah. Well, he's been religious for a really, really long time. Yeah. Even back in like the, uh, back in the octagon... Era. I'm not sure about that. Was. I don't know if he was and, you know, he just wasn't, like, loud and proud about it. But it did seem like later on, you know, as his stuff went more into, like, direct-to-DVD type you know, it's territory. Funny. It's, I, I liked I liked uh, action flicks, but I never got into Chuck Norris. He just always seemed bland to me. He is very bland. Just kind of bland. Yeah. yeah, I don't really get... Like, I can see watching him for, like, you know, the fighting... Because yeah. he is actually a good fighter, unlike yeah. some other people we could name. But um, <laughs> that, that yeah. we did a show about a few weeks yes, ago. Yes, but, uh, ago. <laughs> but yeah, so I can see it like getting into it because of that. But he's just like, he's very blank. He can't like emote. Yeah. It's like... He's not a character, really. No, yeah. And it's like, yeah, he doesn't really have like a lot of charisma or like a no. lot of personality. Uh-uh. Really, the only movie of his that I really liked was that one that was kind of... More like a horror movie. The Octagon yeah. was pretty good, but when and I can't remember the name of that either because God damn it, I'm not even drunk or anything. And At I least with Seagal, you know what you're getting. And the dude, the dude, and, and and he had some good movies in the beginning. He was entertaining, and and, and he's an amazing man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, for sure. He's an amazing man. And he would be the first one to it's tell a you that. Very interesting character. He'd be the first one. Now to you know. That. We've sampled some of his, uh, like we said before in the other shows, we've sampled some of his more his newer shows. And it's fucking boring. He's not hardly in them, and he's just kind of phoning them in. Yeah, that's it's like the just, textbook definition of phoning it yeah, in. Yeah, he's just phoning them in. He's like, um, I'll be in your movie, but I'm just going to sit here and mumble. They're for his movies. Ten minutes. It's him in his own movie. And then I'm going to go sit in my luxury But No, Jenny, that's, that's the amazing thing. He's phoning it in on his own movie. That is very strange. It's yeah. I can't really think of anybody no. else that does that type of thing. Yeah, the, where it's like I, you he's know, producing them. Yeah, it's like oh, it's almost kind of like oh, it's a passion project. Like this is the movie I want to make, and I'm going to fund it and produce yeah, it, and everything yeah. like that. But he's then he can't even in. be bothered. Phone it in. Yeah, he can't even be bothered to like act or <laughs> walk or anything. He had a stunt double walk down the stairs for him. Yeah, we saw that shit. Body double. Well, and like I said, he, he didn't was want anybody know. Like he I said, he was big. doing that a long time ago. Yeah. because I saw like. A clip from a movie that was from like the 90s like yeah. the late 90s or no it was from 2006 yeah. um you know which was a long time ago doesn't seem like it but where they had yeah like he had a stunt double that walked out yeah like walked across the room and out on the balcony and like i said the stunt double just turned toward the camp they didn't even care that it did, and every time that he, you could see his face and it wasn't him every time he has a line and they cut to him he's behind some. Yeah. You just see his head. <laughs> Remember that? They yeah. had the sandbags there, you know what I mean? He, like he's down behind cover. You never yeah. actually see his body, just his head. Yeah, he doesn't want anybody seeing like the... Yeah, and when you do see his body, it's just flashes of it, and then they try to use a stunt double from the back as much as they can to make yeah. him look slim. And you know he's fucking telling him to do that. Well, yeah, wanna, of course. I don't, you know, I had that back injury, and I don't want to, you know... I don't want anybody to see. I haven't recovered from my back. He injury. doesn't want anybody to yeah, see the sea done. turtle that yeah. it, that lives underneath. Yeah, his he's kimono. become he's become a fucking big ass turtle. <laughs> what but was yeah. was funny about now? I'm getting on fucking Seagal. All right, yeah, but no, that's, no. we I'm did getting, a whole show about. Did the a whole, dude. I'm warming up. I'm warming up. <laughs> if Seagal were to embrace that shit and kind of do a Seagal parody, where he's kind of parodying himself, kind of like they did in the Expendables. Yeah. 
It might be a hit. But like I said, he can't, he's he not capable of though. doing that. He's not capable. He, he can't easily do it. takes himself too seriously. He has to have somebody. That's why everybody. That's why everybody picks on him all the time because it's he's easy. too serious. He's too serious. He got to have some. But you know, so is Norris. I think Chuck Norris took himself very, very seriously. Yeah. Oh, definitely. He didn't like those Chuck Norris fucking quotes or Ch- Chuck Norris facts. He tried to sue that guy. Yeah, at first. that's ridiculous. I mean, that's later what he's gonna on, be remembered for. Yeah, later on, he kind of like yeah. he was like, okay, fine, and he like went along yeah. with the joke. But yeah, he tried to sue the guy that wrote that book, and also he used to go after. Um, I you know I don't know who the hell would hire somebody like this, but um, you know how they have like celebrity lookalikes mm-hmm. that'll like show up at your big parties or whatever. It's like, but they don't bill themselves as being the real person. It's just yeah. kind of like a novelty. Like, hey, let's have yeah. all these lookalikes. So apparently, this one guy who was making his living as a Chuck Norris lookalike, Chuck an Norris tried yeah. to sue that guy. It's too. ridiculous. And I'm like, okay, money bags. It's yeah. like here's this poor guy that's just, hey, I look like Chuck Norris. Maybe yeah. I can make a living like. It's a Chuck Norris impersonator. Yeah, and he's not saying that he's actually Chuck Norris. Right. It says right there he's a Chuck Norris impersonator. So you just, like, get him to show up at parties and stuff, and it's funny, and everybody has, like, a little chuckle about it. Yeah. But no, he couldn't even... Having a chuckle on Chuck? Yeah. (laughs) I didn't even realize I did that. I was like, oh, that was pretty awesome. Yeah. I should, like, go back and just say, yeah, I totally did that on purpose. Sure you did. Having a chuckle at Chuck's expense. Chuckle on Chuck. (laughs) But yeah, uh, so uh, all right, are we, are we done talking about? We're Chuck done about we're, about. we're done about martial arts. I'm just, <laughs> so we I just, just went down the damn martial it, arts. It's fast. just kind of like we get on that topic and we get on food, and it's like yeah, we just kind of go off on. All well, these we were watching martial arts movies recently, you know, fucking like the one about you know what was it? Fucking art of self defense. Guys, go yeah. see that if you haven't seen that movie. That movie's fucking fantastic. Yeah, rent it. It's that movie's really fucking funny. great. I mean, that's I mean. It's like it's like a true it's like a true story. That's the way it really was. <laughs> yeah. That's the way Count Dante and in, in the fucking Black Dragon Society they were about like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I figure. Well, probably martial arts aside, we probably are going to end up on more food jokes because yeah. since we're talking about cannibals, just like we done the Jeffrey Dahmer show, which I didn't really mean not for that to about. happen. I'm but... not worried about it. This is not corporate entertainment. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? This is not corporate. This is pro- we are we are independent. You're independent entertainers on YouTube. Woo, it makes it sound so important. Yeah, it's better, huh? <laughs> we don't have to worry about fucking advertisers or corporate backing or anything, just as long as fucking YouTube doesn't step on our dick. Yeah. And I got with dicks. That's plural. <laughs> you got a dick and I got a dick. I don't want, we I'm have gonna, a dick I'm, each. I, I ain't going to let you out. I don't let, I'm, I'm not going to leave you out of it. You know what I mean? I have an honorary you dick. You have an honorary dick. It's like a spiritual dick. Yeah. Oh, okay. We're it's starting early. It's just early. like this when I'm talking. <laughs> it's starting early. I might be an asshole, but I am funny. Uh, you have your moments. Sometimes. <laughs> okay. All right. So, should we talk about the the people eating? What you asking me for? You were you're 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 running the show, man. You're in charge of this shit. Am I? You're in charge of it this. It doesn't shit. feel like it. Sometimes. No, it's just, it's, that's that's your imagination. You're okay. you're running the shit. <laughs> I'm just fucking commenting. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So, uh, oh, I should say, too, that if you're interested in uh, Alfred Packer, uh, which is what his Wikipedia page is called, even though most of the time he's called Alfred, and I'm just going to call him Alfred, because who the fuck is named Alfred? And I'm not saying that. But uh, there's a uh, Harold Schechter, who is a very uh, famous true crime writer. He's written a book about seemingly every true crime you could possibly think of. And he's on pretty much every big documentary about serial killers and stuff. He wrote a book about Alfred Packer that was called Man Eater. Yeah. So uh, that's that I've heard is very good. I've read like excerpts of it, it's wrote, but I, I like all his books. Like he's a really good writer. The ones of uh, his that I've read. So Alfred G. Packer, or Alfred, as I said. Um, as I said, there is some controversy over what exactly happened during this little expedition that he went on. Um, because over the years, he has given several different accounts of what happened. And because there were no other witnesses to come forward and go, hey, no, he's making that up or whatever. Um, no one knows exactly what happened. Although, uh, you know, kind of looking into the forensic evidence, let's call it that. Um, I have my suspicions about what probably happened. And I kind of think that he didn't need to eat these dudes, that he just kind of did it. Maybe he had habits. <laughs> we all have habits. Yeah, he had habits. I have this nasty habit of just, just like killing people and eating them. I just don't, 
Nobody well, take that out of context. That was going to be a gif of me going, I've been asked to have <laughs> Might have been something he picked up before he went out on the range. Yeah. You know, this is 1800s. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't even realize how wild fucking New York was in the 1800s. Well, you've seen gangs in New York, you know, but there were... Even the big cities of the 1800s here in the United States had fucking horrendous ghettos filled with fucking people from Ireland to Germany and Poland and... They did weird shit in there. Weird shit would happen in there. And it wouldn't surprise me if cannibalism was something that could happen every now and then. Yeah, that totally wouldn't shock me either, no. I must say. No, it wouldn't surprise me at all. I'm talking about very intense poverty. Yeah. And lots of criminal activity. Yeah, that too. Uh, no law enforcement to speak of. Yeah, not like you could just call 911. Yeah, on you know, your it's iPhone. funny, you know, modern people take shit, so much shit from fucking granted, you know what I mean? That you can just call a cop. And the cop shows up. Well, shit, even nowadays. Yeah. Some places you can't yeah, do that. Yeah, there are places you're nice you call a cop and there's just no, they're not going to come. They're just like, <clears throat> yeah, go, go check out Detroit. <laughs> yeah, to- right. yeah, we'll totally be there in a minute. No. Yeah, there are places in Detroit where there were signs. I don't know if they're still up there, but they were like, you know, but there is no police service in this area. Enter at your own risk. And they fucking mean it. Yeah. You could be like the predator. And grab a fucking assault <laughs> ri- assault rifle and put on some camo and go around and just shoot people, probably for days, as long as you did wasn't a lot of it. And uh, I don't think I don't think they would care. I don't think they'd care. Probably not. The cops wouldn't care. The, the locals would handle it. They'd come after it themselves if they could. Yeah. Was, you know, and if you were down there burning down the whole fucking town, you know, killing well, hundreds, yeah, some they're going to come. Might get a little miffed. Well, about I think that. the cops will eventually come. But yeah. If you went out there and maybe kill one every few days, it probably wouldn't. They probably wouldn't They're notice. Probably it. Like, eh. They're like, yeah, that shit happens. They probably wouldn't notice any spike or anything. There's no police service. That's what it meant. Yeah. Well, a lot of cities were like that in the 1800s. There was just and and another thing is that the the concept of a professional policeman, that's eh, kind of a new concept. That's a fairly modern concept. Yeah, yeah. they didn't have them. They had kind of like local police but they were more like a night watchman or a security guard they might have to call some kind of an investigator if they gave a shit and try to do some kind of an investigation but that was only for an important person really well and the thing about these particular cases uh the case of alfred packer and the donner party is that these didn't even happen in cities these were like out in the fucking frontier yeah, impossible. Where there was, yeah. like, no, they weren't even states yet in a right. lot of uh, cases. Just, it was yeah. just, like, you know, just random, like, people, right. wagon trains, uh, Native American tribes, and that's about it. The closest thing to a policeman slash investigative body slash maybe security slash authority would have been the Pinkertons. Yeah. Which was a private corporation. That for a long time, even the president used as bodyguards and you know, and like Secret Service. Yeah, they're the, they're, they're quite the famous. Yeah. Uh, for that reason, the Pinkertons were they'd come, go and look for somebody and arrest them. They could do a a pretty good investigation with the technology of the time. But that, there were only maybe a few thousand of those though in the Pinkerton company. You know, it was little. Well, you have you to imagine to, you too. To, this you had to is. Buy it. Yeah, when this it. happened, with, like the Alfred Packer case, this happened in the 1870s. Yeah. This was even before, let's say in England, like Jack the Ripper, yeah. where it's like they didn't even have fingerprinting. They didn't have yeah. anything like that. It's like you pretty much unless you saw somebody like actually committing murder in front of your face, they were probably not going to catch you. <laughs> yeah, and, and then, you know, courts were iffy back then. And if you had a good lawyer and a lot of money, you could get witness testimony discounted. Yeah. You know, it was luck whether or not you got off or not. Luck and money. Well, yeah. Whether or not you got convicted or, or, or you know. Yeah, even yeah. like to an even greater extreme than nowadays. Yeah, oh yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. obviously if you have money nowadays, lo- you probably. Really a lot can. of the um, gunfighters of the Wild West or the Old West, you know, killed 20, 30 people and never served a day, a lot of them. Or if they did serve, just a little bit because they would say, well, they were self-defense. Yeah. You know? He was, you know, that guy came after him, so of course he shot him. And that's self defense. One of the things that was one of the tales that uh, Packer told right. as well. Self defense was just pretty much blanketed everything. Yeah. Um, and you know, I don't doubt that dudes fought. Yeah, they a, did. I'm not lot. saying all of that was bullshit. Right. I'm sure it wasn't. Yeah. And but there's another thing too, you know, guys like you know, 
John Wesley Arden, and you know they were fearsome. If you testified against him, he'd get out eventually, probably, because he was well known, and the kind of, the guys that he was shooting were other gunfighters. So he'd get out in a couple of years, even if he was found guilty. He, they wouldn't kill him for that. He'd kill you if you yeah. testified against him. So it'd probably be best to just say, no, nah, it was self-defense. I saw it happen. Dude came at him. Dude draw. The dude drew, you know. Please don't kill me. <laughs> no, like samurai days, you know yeah. what I mean? You can't, you know, they were all cooking, carrying weapons, and if they didn't like each other, and they were, they were kind of like what was going on with Masashi, you know, you'd get challenged a lot if you had a badass reputation. Yeah. Well, yeah, because so, everybody wants to be the guy. The guy that, who killed fucking killed John Wesley the Harden. Right. Yeah. Now, Harden got out and became a lawyer later. Yeah. But he, he was probably one of the best ones, I think. Well, yeah, he's kind of a, an American yeah. legend. Yeah, and there's a kind of a story that he shot a guy for snoring, and that's not really how it happened. <laughs> it was, not, it was he, he shot, although I, it was an accident yeah shooting somebody for snoring too loud it's like yeah. it sounds excessive but if they, you had to sleep with the same person all the time and they were just constantly uh, i think eventually yeah. it would be like water torture it's not it what just, it was <laughs> i know but i'm just saying they were in this hotel and it was right outside a brothel and it was kind of a cheap hotel and they were all in there trashed and fucking you know and, and harden gets in there and trying to get some sleep, but the dude in the room next to him is fucking snoring. And he shot the wall <laughs> like, to wake the guy up. up. And then rolled back over and fell asleep. But he didn't know, but he actually hit, he hit the guy. Ooh, lucky but they shot. were all drunk, Yeah, too. They were all drunk. And Shit happens. in his defense, he didn't run. Because yeah. he didn't know he hit the guy. Right. He was just drunk and shot at the wall <laughs> like, to try to wake him up. Yeah, like, shut up over there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know that feeling. I know that feeling. <laughs> but they I, didn't have anything against each other. You know what I mean? And yeah, he didn't was, do it on purpose. No, and, and that whole and it was like on a Saturday night. They were all fucking wasted. I mean, technically, yeah. it's true that he yeah. shot a guy for snoring too loud. It's just that he didn't really intend mm. to shoot him no. for snoring too he didn't loud. Try to hit, he wasn't trying to kill him. Right. So, uh, all right. So the year is 1873. Here's Alfred Packer. He's 31 years old. Now, him and a group of 20 other prospectors are going on an expedition from Bingham Canyon, Utah, into the San Juan Mountains in Colorado, looking for gold and various other valuable minerals. Now, later on, he said that he'd actually been the guide or like the head of this expedition, but uh, I don't believe that that was the case. He was probably just like, you know, puffing his own ego up or whatever. So they go out on this, they start to go out on this expedition, and evidently um, they lost some of their food on the way. I don't know if it was stolen or like someone dropped it off a cliff. I don't know. But so they lost some of the food and started getting really hungry. So January 1874, they turn up at a a Ute camp. Uh, This was in northwestern Colorado. Now, they get there, they're all still alive and shit like that, but, uh, you know, the the chief, uh, Ore, I think is how you pronounce his name, he was like, look, you guys, um, you know, we'll give you some food and we'll give you, like, so you can stay here and stuff, but he's like, you really should stay here until springtime because if you set out, you know, going where you were going to go on your expedition, um, it's really, really dangerous. Like, the mountain passes are very dangerous, and it's like, if you go before like the thaw and everything, then you could be camping and just be buried in snow. And that is no fun for anyone. However, five of the prospectors and Alfred Packer decided they don't want to hear that shit. They're like, no man, we're going to have to go now because then we'll get to the mines and get all the good shit before anybody else gets there. So we want to go right now, even though it's an immensely stupid idea. So these six dudes, they're like, no, we're just going to go. And it, at which point, like, Chief Ori is probably like, out of my hands, motherfucker. It's like, I try to tell you. So they leave on February 9th. Now, they apparently only took a 10-day supply of food with them, even though there were six of them. They thought that the journey was only 40 miles. However, it was actually 75 miles, which apparently they were not aware of. So other than Alfred Packer, the other five guys who went with him were named Shannon Bell, 
Israel Swan, James Humphrey, Frank Miller, and George California Noon, who was only 18 years old. So they leave, and those five guys, that's the last time anybody ever saw. Hmm. More than two months go by. People are starting to wonder. I mean, I guess these guys had families and friends and right. stuff like that. And they're like, you know, I wonder whatever happened they to those six guys yeah. that went off on that expedition. Yeah. We haven't heard hiding or hair of them since they uh, took off. Now, there are differing accounts of what happened next. The, apparently, it was either that um, there was a party of prospectors, like a different party that came through uh, you know, at this outpost in the spring and were asking about them and then later like sent a search party out. However, the more famous account of the of what happened was that Alfred Packer came wandering back out all alone. You know? Hmm. Uh, so <laughs> this was uh, April 6th or April 16th. Again, sources differ. Um, he, there also, there was also evidence that he might have been seen a week earlier, uh, in a nearby town. He turned up at the, uh, the Los Pinos Indian Agency, uh, in Colorado. Uh, although, like I said, some witnesses said that they had seen him a week earlier in a town called Saguache, I guess is how you pronounce it, Saguache. Now, when he turned up, he had, ominously, a whole bunch of wallets, no. And he took like a whole bunch of money out of there. Now, he said that he hadn't eaten in a day or two. However, when he got there, he had all this money, but he didn't like buy any food. Uh -huh. He just was like, oh, I want some whiskey. It's looking bad already. He's got well, all yeah, the wallets. See, I'm and, telling you. Yeah. It's, yeah, this is fucked up. Now, his story initially was that, oh, well, we were only a few days into the expedition and I hurt my leg and fell behind the other ones, so I don't have any idea where they went. I thought that they would beat me back here. Like, I would get back here on right. my own and they would be here ahead of me because I thought they were, they had gone on ahead. That was his initial story. So, even from the beginning, people in this saloon that he turned up at, they're like, that sounds... Not entirely plausible. <laughs> They're like, because no one has heard from these five guys since they took off. A lot of times that's not what the guy says is how he says it. Yeah. It probably there's a bunch of voice stress in him and just the way he was talking. They're like, man, this dude's lying. Yeah. Like, nobody seemed to buy yeah. it, like, even from the beginning. Yeah, sketchy kind of way of fucking talking about it. And they're like, this dude's fucking hiding something. Yeah, because they're know. like, you know, somebody, they're like, if these dudes were still wandering around... Um, somebody would have heard from at least one of them. And also they thought it was very suspicious that he had all these wallets and all this money that everyone presumed, probably correctly, that he had stolen from right. the five guys. Yeah, sounds like it. So then later on, apparently, uh, an Indian guide is uh, walking along the trail that uh, Packer and the other guys had taken off on and finds some suspicious looking strips of meat uh -oh. that turn out... To be human flesh. Now, how did they how did they find out that it was human? I'm not really sure. Maybe it looked like maybe it was like a nose. I don't know. I don't know. Right. But they said it. They where did you find him? You found him hanging somewhere. Trying well, they, I guess they were just kind of like along the trail, like on the you know there was just like little scraps or like pieces huh. or whatever. Okay. So so they weren't prepared. You're not talking about jerky. I no, I don't okay. think it was you said I, strips of flesh. I was thinking jerky. Okay. It might have been because they do sometimes like have to jerky people if you're gonna like. Yeah, but it takes time to make it. Well, and, yeah. And you have to know how to do it. And this dude probably doesn't know how to do it. Maybe not. I don't know. I, I, I kind of feel to, like making jerky was probably a pretty um, maybe they to do, common yeah. skill back then. Especially if you were going to be wandering around in the wilderness for any length of time. Well, you got to have the right conditions or it'll just fucking rot. Well, yeah. And the flies will get on it. Mm -hmm. probably, yeah. What? It's probably better just to sit there and smoke it and then just wrap it. There's a bunch of different ways of doing stuff they used to wrap, but you have to have spices, but, you know, yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm th sitting here thinking of a recipe on how to fucking do it. That's what, see, I knew that was yeah. going to happen, because, yeah. like, as soon as fucking cannibalism because it becomes a topic, everyone's going to start yeah. talking about recipes. You want to make all these jerky meat. makers, man, we can make jerky right out of a damn closed car and a parked car on the front. <laughs> Lay it out there, and it just fucking turn right into jerky. Probably would. Yeah, in the Florida heat. 
yeah. Just like a, a couple times in the summer, just for shits and giggles, I wanted to see if I could actually cook an egg on the driveway. Yeah. Like, not this driveway, but, like, at my grandmother's house. Mm. It worked. Hmm. Yep. <laughs> yep. Florida, y'all. So, yeah. So, as I said, you know, nobody bought uh, his initial version. It was like, he was just like, I don't know what happened to him. I just got left behind because my leg was blah, 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 blah. So, nobody bought it. So, apparently, there was, like, a lot of pressure on him. Like, people kept bugging him to be like, come on, man. It's like, we know that's not what happened. Um, you really need to, like, tell us what really happened to these people because it's not looking good. So about a month after he had returned, he finally said, okay, um, yeah, I, I know what happened to everybody, and I will give you a confession. This was on May 8th of uh, 1874. So he gave a confession, and uh, this was, like, it was, like, signed over, like, to, by some official whatever. So this was his, uh, so I guess this would be the second version of the story, because the first version was that he didn't know what happened to him. Like, they just, like, left him, and he, they were alive when he left him. This is the second version of what he said happened. He said that <clears throat> pretty much as soon as they started out on the expedition, he said the weather was really shitty, and um, their supplies, of which they had not taken enough, because they thought the, uh, the journey was about half the length of what it actually was, uh, that their supplies ran out. Then they said that um, the lakes were like frozen, so they couldn't really fish in there, that there wasn't a lot of game and they couldn't hunt. And they said they were at a spot where it's like, well, we didn't, it was too far to go back, but like we didn't really want to go forward either just because like the conditions were so terrible. So at this point they were like, already starving i guess it had been i don't know how long it had been but it had been long enough that they were like starting to starve according to him now packer initially said that the five guys died of mostly natural causes just like while they were going along the trail and then then they ended up just eating the ones that had died you yeah. know what i'm saying so he was saying so you'll find them like at various spots along the trail because wherever they drop dead from, you know, hunger or exposure or whatever they died of. And then the rest of us would eat that guy right. and then we would keep on going. That was what he claimed. Uh, and like I said, later on, they found out that that's not what happened. But yeah. So um, and he also said at least one of them um, had gone crazy from the hunger and they had ended up having to kill him because he was like attacking them. So self-defense mm. again. Now he said that Israel Swan, uh, was the first one who died. Uh, he was the oldest, he was 65 years old. And he said that he died only 10 days after they had left the Ute camp. Um, and he said that, so that guy died of like natural causes and then they all ate off him. They were already that hungry, according to him? That's what I mean. It's like, I, Ten well, days? the thing about it, though, it's, and, and I was, like, thinking about this in regards to the Donner Party type of thing. You have to think that even though it doesn't sound like that long, like 10 days without eating, because, I mean, a person can go, like. 30, depending on how fat you are. Yeah, I mean, I've, yeah. I think the person that went the longest without eating, like, it was, like, three months or something like that. I mean, it depends on how much body fat you have. But the thing about it is that you have to understand how many calories they were expending. Yeah. Like during the course of the day. Like, but look didn't at the, they have food with them when they left? They did, but they said that they used it all up. Because, like By I said, what? They, I don't know. Well, uh, presumably yeah. did. But well, it's, it's hard to say because Packer's story was different every time. Yeah. So I'm not sure entirely what happened. It just didn't seem like it was long enough for them to be desperate enough to end up eating people because the, you know, in the case of the Donner party, I mean, they, I mean, these were like hardcore people. They were like stuck in the fucking snow and all this other kind of shit. They pretty much exhausted every other possibility. They were eating their shoes. They were eating the oxen fucking skin. They were eating twigs and shit like that before they actually like got around, to the got people. around to the people. Yeah. And they mostly just ate the ones that died of natural. There was a couple martyrs in there too, but um, they mostly just ate the people that died of other things. Um, I don't think that was the case in Packer's situation because I think, I don't know if he deliberately set out 
saying, I'm going to kill and eat these motherfuckers. I don't, I don't know if he actually thought that or if they just got out and it was kind of like hard. And then he was just like, fuck it. I'm just going to kill. Like maybe they really did run out of food. And he was just like, yeah, I'm not having this. Well, okay. What are the other story? What's the other explanation? Well, this is okay. So he said, Israel Swan died first. He was the oldest one. Uh, and then they had all eaten off him. Then he said about four or five days later, James Humphrey died. And then they ate him too. Now, he said James Humphrey had $133 on him, which in today's money is about three grand. So Packer did like confess. He's like, yeah, I took it because I figured he's dead and he doesn't need it anymore. So I might as well take it. Um, He did not say how the other two people in the party reacted to him taking the money. Just because, like I said, I think this story is probably largely bullshit. Now, the third guy that died was Frank Miller. I think he was a German. And uh, for whatever reason, Packer called him the butcher. Now, he said that Frank Miller died. He was out looking for wood. Or no, Packer was out looking for wood. And Frank Miller died in an accident, although he didn't specify what the accident was. He said that... He was out. I see. He's like, I wasn't even there, man. And then Frank Miller dies at the camp. And then he's like, and then I came back to the camp and the other two guys were already eating him. You know what I mean? So he said that he didn't have anything to do with that. Hmm. Um, You know, so I don't know if he said that he ate because he did say he ate the other two guys. So, you know, I don't know why he would be weird about like eating this up one particular guy. But he just said it wasn't his idea. that They were were already eating him when he got back from looking for work. Here's the thing. (laughs) For me, that's almost sounding a little more plausible. Because it'd be really hard for one guy to overpower five guys at the same time and eat them all. Yeah. Which meant that he had to do it one at a time. And the first time he did it, and the second, he'd have four, three, two, and one witness to everything he did. Yeah. So that means that they were kind of going along with it. You would think that maybe during this, there were other people involved with like, yeah, we're going to have to eat this guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, we're going to eat that one. It may have been kind of a group effort. Because how could one guy do it? Yeah. He'd have to kill them all at the same time with something like a pistol. Yeah. I could see it like that. But eating them one at a time over a certain period of time and the other one's tolerating it be hard. Well, I have my own theories. And, and you know, when we get to the end of the story, you may, like, uh, okay. have a, we'll a new insight into it. Because I would think that if, peop- if the whole party eats itself, it's because there's more than one person doing it. Yeah. It's a eat fest. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? It's like... It's a cannibal lollapalooza. Yeah, they're all fucking hungry, and then they're turning on the weakest one and eating him. Yeah. And it just keeps doing that. Because they after a while, that. like, hunger... That's like... Being that hungry does make you... Yeah. Crazy. And as soon as but, they start seeing one guy faltering, they might... He's going to he's gonna be dead in a few hours. Let's go ahead and finish him off and eat him. Yeah. And, and you know what I mean? And they might be... That's basically what crickets do in a bait box. Yeah. You know, if those crickets run out of food, they start eating each other. Yeah. And, they, and they'll just turn on one of them, and, they, and somebody will bite him, and he'll be the weakest one, and then they all start turning on that one, and then they all eat that one. Yeah. Until somebody decides to bite somebody else, and then he becomes the weak one. It's like, oh, Bill the Cricket said yeah. that that one was the one we could eat, so let's all eat that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, whoever's injured is the weak one. Yeah. So, you know. So just one one cricket has to, like, take the initiative. Start, yeah, to start it and then get him bit. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, they all start turning on him. I kept, like, I kept thinking about when I was, like, um, watching some documentaries and shit like that about the Donner Party. And how they're saying that, you know, you know, hunger will actually make you crazy, like, after a while. Like, it'll make you go into, like, a fucking, like, feral and shit. Um, it took quite a long time for that to happen uh, in the Donner Party. Um, that, that's why I think the Packer one, I, I, I feel like maybe it, it just didn't seem long enough. I mean, yes, the conditions were bad. Uh, yes, it was winter time. Yes, it was the mountains and stuff, but it really seemed like he resorted to that, like maybe more quickly than I'm not really sure, but it, it yeah. just, I kept thinking about all I can think about, and I'm sorry about this, but all I can think about is like one of those Looney Tunes cartoons where like somebody's really hungry and then they see somebody walking by and they turn into a chicken leg or like a yeah. fucking ham hock or something. Right. <laughs> it's like, that's kind of like what I imagine 
that it's like. You know what I mean? I don't know. I've been very hungry before. A lot of times, hunger pains subside and they go away. You just well, it does after a while. And you know what I mean? I've done a lot of time in the field, just fucking hump, you know, in the infantry, fucking humping around, fucking 40, 50, 60 pound fucking rucksacks along with the M60 and all the other kind of shit. Two cans of ammo. Winter time too, you know, with all your fucking sleeping bags and extreme cold weather gear. You end up in, in winter, you're carrying your own body weight. And my, at that time, it was probably about 140, 150 pounds. Probably 145 pounds. That's probably what I carried. But you would think, how could a person carry 140? You can. You know, it's just that it's spread out over your body. So it's not as hard as you think it is. It's not like you're holding it. Yeah. You know. But, uh, so I know what it's like. You just kind of go numb. It's fucking really cold. You're just beyond exhausted. You kind of just disassociate from your body. You're kind of like eyeballs. You just feel like your eyeballs. Eyeballs walking around in the woods. But if you got hungry, you'd start to get weak and you'd um, probably have... I would think that they were probably sleeping a lot, though, too. It depends on how much they were moving. They were on foot. I Everything See, that I saw, Lee, I assumed that they were on foot. They might have been on horseback. Why do you uh, eat the horses? Where's the horses? I don't think that they were, though, because, like I said, I don't it's ever see... Weird. I've never seen any mention because, that there were horses for them to eat. Because... In general, it's a death sentence to be walking around out in the West. Yeah, you well, and especially back then, and in the yeah. wintertime, in the mountains. Yeah. And it wasn't like nowadays where like a lot of the trails are like mapped or like people know where they go. It's like back then, everybody's like, yeah, we think maybe just that way. Well, they were calling it an expedition. Maybe they were just rucking it. They just had fucking rucksacks on. Yeah, I mean, there was only six of them. So I, mean, I don't know why they weren't carrying mules. They, uh, you'd at least you'd think they'd have mules with them, like to carry the to carry stuff. their shit. Fucking and, and you can eat mules. It just you... seemed really ill advised. Because yeah. well, because like I said, when they went to, they had already been having problems um, when they got to the Ute camp in yeah. January, and the guy was like, "Man, it's like winter time. You probably yeah. want to stay here till spring because otherwise you're going to be fucking right. hosed out there on the thing." But they just went anyway, and, and it seems like they didn't take enough stuff. Yeah, you, there's no mention of rifles, right? Well, they well they had guns. I don't know about rifles, but I think I know for sure that Packer had uh, a revolver at least. Because, you know, you're going to want to carry a little thirty caliber and twenty two. Well, yeah, I mean, in case you like... Muzzle-loading rifles so you can eat. Yeah. Squirrel, you know, and uh, you can I presume that they were all armed because they said that they did try to hunt for game, but there just wasn't much of it around. I just see, man, it's just like... But like I said, you're... This is only coming from Alfred Packer, and he has a vested interest in not necessarily telling people what actually happened to make himself look better. Wintertime in the mountains, there'd still be squirrels and birds and... You know what I mean? It's not lifeless out there. Now, I don't know what the water situation was. They must have been around water because they weren't carrying it. Well, I if don't know if they were if carrying it. If there's water, it. you can fish. You know, there's still fish. No, he there. said that they were going to try and fish, but yeah. he said the lakes and shit were frozen over. You just break the top of it. It was like a bad, you yeah, know. Well, he's, he's a, well a similar thing happened with, um, with uh, the Donner Party. One of the problems that they had, too, I mean... They really got shit on by life. I'm actually surprised any of them survived after listening to the litany of horrors that they had to go through. But the problem with what happened with the Donner Party was that that winter was really, really bad. Like, some of the lakes were frozen all the way down. They were frozen solid. So it wasn't just a kind of a case where you just cut a hole in the ice or shit like that. There was nothing. It was just frozen all the way down Hmm. because it was like a really, really severe winter. Actually, there were frozen fish down in there. Probably, but it's you know how probably too, probably too weak you to couldn't get, get to it. Yeah, because at that point, You're you know, so weak that they couldn't yeah. do much of anything. You got to stay strong when you're out there. You can't wait till you get weak. Once you're weak, you're dead. Well, yeah, you that's stay on top exactly kind of what happened. When, when you're out there, especially when it's cold, you know, like in Korea, it'd be 40, 50 degrees below zero at night. Insanely fucking cold. We're out there in sleeping bags. You know, we had extreme cold weather bags, but still, it's just not enough at that temperature. Yeah. Sometimes they had us walking through the whole night, I think, to keep us from fucking dying. Yeah. yeah. Because as long as you're staying moving and you got the right gear on, you won't die. Yeah. As soon as you stay, as soon as you stop, you probably will at that temperature. Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah, that you 50 to 45, would. To 45 to 50 degrees below zero. Insanely cold. Yeah. It's just like a, it was tra- traumatic for me. And that was my first time going to the field. It was team spirit, man. <laughs> team spirit. And that's the, you know how they're always talking about 
the annual war games that pisses off North Korea, mm-hmm. that's Team Spirit. Yeah. My first time going into the field was with Team Spirit with the 506. And all the veteran guys that were there were fucking tisk tisken because we were there was like about 40 new 40 new troops that I got that all came into the unit at the same time. They were my basic training platoon. We all fucking blended in with this new unit and they were just fucking pitying us. Like, you guys fucking suck, you weak. You guys aren't going to make it. You know, that kind of shit. <laughs> Boy, your first field problem, Team Spirit. You guys are fucking soft as fuck. All you guys are pussies. Well, I'm, you know, they, and it, it was true, man. We were fucking, we were ate the fuck up. That shit was traumatic. Yeah. Yeah, I never forget it. <laughs> that shit was fucking terrible. Yeah, no thanks. Uh, the first time I go to the field, I got, and, I, and they made me a sixty gutter because they said you're, you're the runt. They said I was, you're, you're the runt of the fucking. <laughs> we're gonna go ahead and get this over with and fucking send you back to McDonald's where you can flip burgers. <laughs> That pissed me off, of course. There's no way I was going to fail after that. You know, no, gave me that fucking M60 and shit. Oh, man, it was cold, man. Yeah. And the first time, the first movement, we run off the truck, 18-kilometer fucking movement across the fucking mountains before we bedded down. It was fucking, it, it was all night walking. Yeah, even, even the old guys were pissed off. Anyway, I don't want to get, but I, I, know what they're, I know what he's talking about. It's just that, the difference was is that in a military situation, you're driven to show up at a certain place by a certain time. You have to make it there. These guys don't have to make it. So they could have changed course and gotten to a better place where they could survive or, or you know, dig. Dig into the side of the hill, make a shelter. You know, start making a permanent camp to, to camp out through the winter. Find a location for that. He's not talking like that. See that's what See, it's, 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 uh, I kind of think. I kind of feel like he. I don't know if he planned this exactly from the beginning, but I don't know if he planned to like eat them and shit like that. But I do think he was planning something nefarious, even from like when they. He was just kind of like, man, I'm just gonna shoot went, and kill these dudes. And then up. maybe the fact that it's like, oh, they ran out of food. He's like, well, might as well eat them since I already shot them. I, I kind of feel like that it was sounds an like issue. it got hard. It got rough out there. Yeah. And he buckled and said, fuck it, I'm going to kill these dudes so I can live. Yeah, I kind of feel like I that's think that's what happened. what happened. Yeah. And it was freezing out there, so you could kill them all at once. Yeah. And they would stay frozen. Well, like I said, I suspect that that's probably what happened. Because, yeah. like I said, I'll get and into he that ate later. frozen meat during that, during that winter. How much yeah. I bet? Yeah, I'm sure he did. Yeah. So, um, so as I said... He said that uh, he wasn't there for the killing of Frank Miller, but that um, that Frank Miller died in an accident while he was out gathering wood, and he came back, and the other two guys were already eating him. Um, so the next one that died was the 18-year-old boy, George California Noon. Packer, again, said that he wasn't there for this shit, which to me, this just seems like he's like, I wasn't even there. I just came back and this shit was happening. It just sounds very, very implausible to me. Mm -hmm. He said he had gone off away from the camp for a couple of days because he was like looking for game and like hunting and stuff. And he said when he got back to the camp that Bell had shot the 18 year old boy using Israel Swan's gun. So he's like, he, I don't think he said like why that that happened, but he said, so he's like, I did eat the kid, but I wasn't there. Like Bell shot him. So only Packer and Bell are left at this point. Now, according to Packer, he said that after they had eaten the kid, that Bell decided that he was going to kill Packer. This is what Packer said. So Packer, of course, decides I'm going to kill Bell in self-defense. Hmm. Right, he says that Bell like swung his rifle at him, uh, and all this other kind of shit. Okay, so, so they did have had... rifles. Yeah, they did. All right. So, and they they said so that Packer was the only one left. So, when he got back, he said that's that's absolutely what happened. Whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God, he swore he signed it and everything like that. I got a feeling that these dudes embarked on this damn expedition with no field experience or very little field experience for a winter. How much do you want to bet? They just didn't know what they were getting into. Well, it does seem dumb that they only took 10 days worth of provisions for six guys. Yeah. I mean, 
like I said, even, I mean, they thought that it was only 40 miles, but still, I mean, you would take extra. It did end up being like 75 miles, apparently, like where they were actually going to. But So they had 10 days supplies. For six guys. To go 40 miles. That just, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like, I don't know how much that is, but it just doesn't seem like very much to me. You know what I'm saying? Like for the winter time. Yeah. Because you're not going to make ten days. Very, yeah. You're not going to make very good time I in the what, winter. I wonder what they considered to be one days of supplies. That's what I was kind of wondering. I'm yeah. not entirely sure like what they would consider. Because as I said, it has to do with well, how much, how many calories are you planning on burning that day? Yeah. Like, are you you know walking? Are you on horseback? Are you climbing mountains? See, I've are never, you? I've never carried ten days worth of MREs. More than I don't think I've ever carried any more than about four. Yeah. So how much bulk are they talking? You well, yeah, I mean? and like it was different back then. Well, yeah, back then they. So didn't what are they have talking like about? Are they compact. talking about pemmican? Are they talking about Probably. jerky? Are they talking about coffee? Sometimes they say, "Well, coffee is a supply. That's a ration." Well, yeah, they always like they thought took. that was a food. That was a coffee was a food group. It definitely was. Yeah, back I don't understand that. There's no calories there. Not really. Uh, coffee has very, very few and, calories. And no nutritional value. No. So you got to figure that they're out there with some inferior ass shit. Because the 1800s, they didn't really know much about nutrition. Yeah, the shit they best ate. Thing that, the best thing to have for any kind of survival ration back then would have been jerky and pemmican. Yeah. You could kind of live on that. I was reading an article the other day about making your own pemmican. Yeah. But I don't think you could... <laughs> Nowadays, just for shit. But these giggles. dudes might have been kind of dumb. They might have been trying to live off of coffee and tobacco. And maybe hardtack. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which hardtack, that's just damn fucking flour. Flour and water. <laughs> well, see, that's why I'm kind of thinking that. Because when I was reading about the Donner Party, um, like a lot of... They took a lot of flour with them, and I'm yeah. guessing that's why, like, to make yeah. hardtack with. There's no fucking nutritional value Not, in that. No, but it's like, they didn't, I don't think they really knew, knew anything about that. They didn't have, like, fucking nutritionists and shit like that back yeah, then. Yeah, they said, well, if you can eat it, then it keeps you alive. Yeah. No, Which, that, that's, not, that's not what the deal is. Not exactly. <laughs> Try to live off fucking ramen. I tried it one time when I was fucking poor. <laughs> it, it, there's no nutrition in there. You get fucking sick quick. Yeah, I mean, you're going to yeah. get, like, all kind of vitamin deficiencies. Yeah, you get sick real quick. I think back in back in those days, they I don't think they understood that concept. Right. Like you said, if it was food, then it, then, it kept you alive. Then all food was equally yeah. good. You right. know what I mean? It was they didn't have a concept of protein. Or that you yeah. needed, like, a variety, a variety. of things, right. like, to keep you from getting sick. Right. They didn't, you know, sc- they knew about scurvy by this point. So they, they did, yeah. But, uh, so they skirt, knew that you had to have citrus. Some kind of citrus. Uh, but there was you could sidestep that, though. If you, you know, Well, pemmican kind of had citrusy type stuff in it. So. Yeah. And, yeah, it's just, it makes me wonder. They must have been very poorly equipped. I kind of got that feeling. Like I said, it almost seemed like a half-ass, like a last minute. Yeah. Because all the other guys that had come to the Ute camp with them, because there was like 20 guys, well, 21 guys originally, most of them didn't go. Most of them stayed at the camp and were like, yeah, we're totally going to wait till springtime because that's right. the intelligent thing to do. But it's just these six guys decided to just like fucking go off and... Yeah, so I'm sitting here, I'm kind of making a moral judgment on the dude based on my experiences with going to the field in the infantry. But my experiences are clouded because I was given good rations. Yeah. See, MREs are fucking badass. Well, that would, or, you know, especially compared to what these dudes were probably eating. And you have to think too so, that you had like modern, modern clothing, clothing, modern and shoes, right? So they went out there and they and the elements just whipped that ass. It beat that ass when they were out there. Which, if you don't have and, the right shit, it yeah, will do that to anyone. Right. And then, Nature hates you. And seriously. then they're trying to fucking live off of some fucking eighteen hundred survival fucking rations that probably had no nutritional value. Yeah. And they bought it just because that's what they sold them when they went to the damn trading bus. Oh yeah, you can make it on that. Here, here. <laughs> some hardtack. Here, coffee here, here's some tech. tobacco. Here's some fucking coffee. Yeah. You, oh, you, you, that's all you need. You got all the major food groups. <laughs> all the major food. You got all the major food groups. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then they get out there, you know what I mean, and they wonder why they're fucking sucking so bad. Yeah. You know? Why am why, I so tired? Why am I so tired? Why am I so weak? Why, you know, oh man, hand me some of that chaw. You know, so they're spitting out all, they're chewing tobacco and spitting out all their water, all their fluids, yeah. getting dehydrated. And that really starts fucking with your mind. You know what I mean? So they're in a delirium. I can see how it Okay, if through dehydration, exhaustion, malnutrition. And they just fucking lose it and start eating each other. Yeah. Or one of them loses it and it loses it and decides to eat the rest of them. Because, you know, when it with life, you know, their life will find a way. That's it. <laughs> that, <laughs> From Jurassic Park, life yeah. will find a way. And that's what happens, you know. Biology is powerful. People want to live. And maybe just dude fucking lost it. He just started just, seeing... I'm going to get me some protein. He started seeing all the little guys as like chicken little legs. chicken legs right. bouncing around in the snow. Right. Just like that. So I'm kind of think, <laughs> I'm, like I'm thinking that's probably what we're talking about here. That that was the motive. Or that was the situation. I, I kind of suspect that he was considering killing them from the beginning, like just so. to rob them. And then when shit got hard and they ran out of stuff, he's like, well, might as well eat them too, like while I'm at it. Yeah. I just kind of feel like that's maybe. I don't know. There's, I don't think he was intending ra- to eat them from the start, but I think he was intending to like rob them for sure. Well, I'm kind of. And thinking, maybe kill them. I'm thinking, it's more, I'm, I'm thinking it's more likely that one thing led to another. Yeah, he was on the expedition, but they no nobody they they really started to suffer because they just were ill equipped. He decided to eat them, and then they had money. Yeah, so you keep the money. Yeah, because he's like, well, they're not. And then afterwards, it. when you're a little bit better fed, you kind of come to your senses, and you're like, oh shit, you know what I mean? I better think of a Feeling story. Feeling a little better, you know? What I mean? I gotta, <laughs> how am I gonna explain this? Yeah, you know I mean? some shit like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, probably. And you're probably not talking about a real high IQ dude in, 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 to begin with anyway. Or he'd have been up in the middle class somewhere fucking out in Wellesley, Massachusetts. You know? With his family and his little wagon and shit. Fucking, you know, working at the local grocery store, you know? But that's not who you're talking about here. No. You're talking about probably a dude came from the hood. Yeah. So, <laughs> I can see it. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. It's probably, you know, you're dealing with like River Phoenix from that damn fucking Western movie that he was in. Remember that one that we saw? <laughs> That's who you're talking about. Probably. <laughs> what was the name of that movie? Uh, Do you remember? No. I don't, yeah, I don't remember kind what you're talking about. That Western movie we saw had West, fucking Phoenix in it. It was before The Joker came out. He played that fucking crazy fucking dude from the Wild West. It was about two brothers. Uh, it's about two brothers and they were doing something. We saw it in the theater. Uh, I can't remember. It wasn't a bad movie, just didn't make a big impression. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm just kind of getting a feel for what, who these guys are. That's probably what it was. Yeah. So, he comes back and tells him this story, and like I said, he signed it and everything. He's like, this is exactly what happened, I promise. So... So, they send out a search party. Now, according to Alfred Packer's story... All the guys were killed at different times, which would lead you to assume that they would find their body in five different places. Yeah, if they were moving, of course. Um, You know, so he's like, uh, okay, well, I'll take you to where I think where I last saw them, and then we'll see if we can find the bodies. However, the search party could not locate any of the bodies. Now... Uh, so when they get back to uh, Saguache, they decide to arrest him on suspicion of murder because the authorities didn't believe this story either. <laughs> Yo, okay. So August of 1874, which, um, you know, was a few months afterward, there was a, an artist for Harper's Weekly magazine. He had been sent out uh, to, you know, do a fucking do some drawings or shit like that and he was going across the wonderfully named slumgullion pass and he found five sets of human remains laying all together in a cluster near the bank of the lake fork of the gunnison river yeah well that tells you right there. all together 
Um, and apparently the drawing that he did, which is actually quite famous because he sat there and like drew because they didn't have like, you know, cameras weren't all that widespread or anything. So he sat there and drew it. It's uh, pretty grisly looking. You could still, most of them are recognizable. One of them didn't have a head. Uh, they later found out that that was Frank Miller, the butcher, um, just for, from process of elimination because mm -hmm. they could recognize all the other ones. But they had clearly been um, killed and defleshed in places. Like yeah. some of them, like they still had the face, but then like all the meat was gone off their leg and all this other kind of shit. So you think um, they were killed, what, with gunshots? It's hard to tell because some of the... It did appear that at least one of them had something that looked like a gunshot. Some of the bones apparently had holes in them, but they weren't sure if it was bullet holes or if it was just, like, from animals or if it was some other thing. You know what I mean? It was kind of hard to tell. So they also found, among these five bodies, which, like I said, were still recognizable, uh, more or less, as the prospectors... Uh, they found, like, a bunch of torn clothing, some blankets, um, some shreds of human flesh. But, um, you know, it had been several months, so the weather, you know, the elements, animals, stuff like that had eaten part of them. So it was kind of, like, all torn up, and they weren't really sure, like, how they had been left, you know what I mean? Um, now, apparently their feet had been, like, bound up in blankets, so I'm assuming that, I don't know if they, like, ate their shoes, and so they, like, wrapped blankets around their feet at some point Maybe. because they found that's what I'm kind of figured because that happened to the Donner party as well. They ended up having to like eat their shoes and whatnot. Um, but they didn't find any guns. They didn't find any, uh, cooking utensils. Uh, like I took said, all that they didn't find any of their shoes yet. Yeah. Um, as I said, one of the sets of remains was missing the head. Uh, two of the bodies had pieces of flesh cut out. One had been taken out of like the chest area and one out of the thigh. Uh, one of the bodies, there were like a bunch of marks left on it that clearly looked as though this person had put up a fight. So this is not a case of like these people died of accidents or they just died of like exposure or whatever. And then, oh, well, we, I guess we better eat them. This looked like somebody murdered at least this one person. And they were, the feet were wrapped up. On those bodies in that spot right there. Yeah. Okay, so were they living there and killed there? In other words, like was that their camp? I'm not. Or they they said it was. They there? said it was hard to tell because they didn't find like they found clothes and shit, but they didn't find like any pots and pans or anything like that would suggest that that was. And where nothing camp suggested was. that there was a fire there or anything. Not that I ever heard. And they of, were moved know. there. Perhaps. Yeah. How much you want to bet he got desperate? And, and he was like, we're all going to die. Because they were eating shoes and doing shit like that. Mm -hmm. So he said, fuck it. He went for his gun while they were asleep and started gunning them down. He says, I'm going to eat them and get enough strength. I'm going to take all this shit and get See, out See, that's here. what I kind of figured. Probably what happened. Because, like I said, obviously the second story that he told was bullshit because he said that they all died at different times and then they just ended up eating them. He killed them all at but once. But he killed them all at once because they found them all together. The, the, the more likely scenario is that they were at a camp and they were fucking holed up in that camp and they were desperate. Maybe like one or two of them were too sick to move or frostbite and couldn't move. And the, and, and the party was bogged down. He realized, shit, we're just going to sit here and starve to death and die. You know, maybe one yeah. by one. And probably have to eat each other one by one. And so he's thinking about it and he goes, fuck it, if I just kill them all, I'll eat them all right now. Yeah. And then I'll get the strength to walk out of here. That's. I think that's probably and that's exactly probably what he, what he did. did. So you know what? what? In a way, that in a situation like that, that might have been the right decision. Although, like I said, I don't know... How bad it was, like if it was actually bad, or if he just decided he was just going to jump the gun and be like, fuck it, I'm just going to kill all these people. Because they were you, all still alive, evidently. How much you bet they were all dying, though? Maybe they were, I don't know. I bet you he was dying. It's hard to tell. And then a couple of other ones were too sick to move, and then the other ones were dying, and they were thinking, they were all thinking about, well, shit, when these sick ones die, we'll eat them. Yeah. But then the next logical step was, is, you know, like, well... Not a lot not a lot of food to go around. We'll just sit here until another one will get sick and then we'll eat that one. And then eventually it'll get down to just one guy. Yeah. Starving to death, sitting here with these dead bodies. 
So he's the one thinking about that, and he goes, you know what? I can jump the gun, though. Yeah. If I kill them all, you know, because we're all going to die anyway. If, but if I kill these I'll, guys, I'll have plenty of food. I have plenty of food. I'll eat them all over a period of a couple of days, regain my strength. I'll pick up, I'll take all this shit, and I'll go back home. Yeah. I think that's exactly what that's he did. That's probably what happened. I think that's exactly what he did. I think I might have solved it. And then after well, he Well, I think that's what most people think. That yeah. That's and then, and then. That's just not what he said happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was trying to hide it. He, yeah. just, he didn't want people to know that that was the decision that he made. Mm hmm. Which, in a situation like that, that may have been the right decision. Had he not done that, they probably would have sat there one by one, starved to death, needed each other. Yeah. Bogged it down. It's probably what it. Because it, it might have been the psychology of the situation. The guys that he w was with, maybe they were kind of like guys that were too. Too starving, too out of their mind to make rational decisions. You yeah. Know? So you couldn't stay. You had to leave. I mean, that's a tough call. I had to see what the situation was. That's what I mean. And no uh, one, no one knows what the situation was yeah. other than him. Yeah. I I, I bet you they were, none of them were in the shape to move. Maybe not. And I bet you he wasn't in the shape to move. I bet they were all about fucking out of their minds. I bet you at least one of them was getting ready to die. So they couldn't leave him behind. Yeah. You know? They were probably talking about eating him when, when he did die. Yeah. But by the by the time that one was dead and eaten, chances are another one would have been ready to die too. And then another one ready to die. Because they were all deteriorating. Yeah. And that's not enough food at once to gain any strength. But if you had five bodies, you could sit there and fucking eat them all. And over a period of a few days, get strong enough to walk back out of there. And I bet mm, you that's what he did. Long pig. Eating that long pig. But yeah, Eating so... that long pig. <laughs> you know, black people say white people smell like bologna. Yeah, I don't know if they smell like bologna, but really? they might taste like bologna. Yeah. As we black... probably do yeah, taste my... like bologna. Yeah. Yeah, I Roughly. Fucking, yeah. I mean, it depends on the person, I guess. So, like, yeah. what their diet is. I used to hang out I with... haven't eaten bologna since I was a kid. I used to hang out with this dude. He was a fucking, what, what, what you call a hotep. And he was kind of like a, he was, it's kind of like black liberation theology. He was real fucking, he didn't like, but he didn't like, he didn't like white people. He liked me though, man. We would sit there and fuck with each other all the time and shit. He's like, y'all, y'all fucking cave dwellers smell like baloney. <laughs> 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 Calling me cave dwellers. Saying that I was made by a fucking ancient Egyptian scientist and shit. You know, wow, that? that's ancient so, I've, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ancient, yeah, he's that. going through all that. I play, I play games with this dude fucking all fucking day, and, and you know, I just just I don't know what it was. You know, what I mean, I, I would just fucking resonate with the dude. He's fucking hilarious, man. That doesn't was, surprise me. That's, oh, it's fucking that's, funny. That sounds like the type of dude that you would hang. Yeah. With. <laughs> because you would you would have a dude, lot of comments. He was fucking funny, man. He was funny. Well. <laughs> They might be hoteps out there listening right now, man. This shit was fucking funny. You never know. Yeah. Do I smell like baloney? I don't know. Uh, I don't really think I smell like baloney. I don't really think I smell like anything. All your white devils smelling like fucking baloney. Maybe we do. <laughs> I don't know. It would make sense. Like I said, it's don't don't cannibals say that humans taste like pork? That's like why they pork, call them yeah. long pig. Yeah. Well, and I heard something. Where, where did I hear this earlier? I don't even remember, but... Mm -hmm. Apparently, uh, someone who's like an EMT or something, and they deal with like burn victims. Yeah. They said, I don't want to be indelicate, but humans, they it kind of smells like barbecue. Yeah. Like when you get like a yeah. like a burn victim and stuff. And I'm like, well, it's he, true. We're just, yeah. we're, we're just meat. Yeah. So. Can't get too wrapped up. I think, I think maybe dude just made a fucking command decision in a pinch. Yeah. I think he thought that everybody was going to die, so he was going to go ahead and fucking kill all these dudes. Yeah. And well, he'd have enough fucking strength to walk out of there afterwards, and but he couldn't explain it. So what ended up happening was that I mean, because I still have like quite a bit to go on this case, so I'm trying to like turn and kiss because yeah. we're gonna have to like take a break in a minute because it's yeah. more than an hour. But so they find the five bodies all, so they know that Alfred Packer's story is bullshit because he said they were all scattered all over, and they found them obviously all together, and they'd all been murdered, or at least one of them had been murdered because he looked like he'd struggled. So they're like that motherfucker. So they go back to Saguache and they're going to like confront him with this yeah. like, hey, we know you're full of shit. And when he got back, they figured out that he had escaped from jail. 
Yeah. <laughs> and so they didn't find him for quite a while. Yeah. So we will get into that uh, in a minute. We're probably going to take a break because I think it's over an hour. Yes, it is. But here's the thing. If we take a break now, you'll be able to wrap it up because we've got to do the Donner Party too. Well, I know, but you know. Okay, it's going to be another three and a half hour fucking show. Well, hey, whose fault is that? It's your fault. Yours. You're choosing two. You're cho- no, you're choosing two. You're giving them two topics. Yeah. Two. That's like but you went shit. off on like all these that's tangents like, that's that, my that job. took like a really long that's time. That's my fucking job. So it's like not my. I would have been that's through my the shit. Fucking job. I would have been through the shit like okay. a long time ago right. okay. if you hadn't kept going off on all the right. all this stuff that you went off all right. on. <laughs> but yeah, See, this so, is what I put. This is what I deal with. Okay. <laughs> This is, what, this is what I deal with. I'm okay. like just I'm trying to get back on topic, and you're just going off on these. Okay, things. well I just uh, I mean like I said, people like when the shows are long. Okay, I'm just saying like don't blame me because this isn't really that long a topic. It's just that. Well, I, okay. Well, I gotta finish this. Right? That's what I'm saying. Okay, and then you have to go. You right. have to go refill that and yeah. go find the kitty because I think she's okay. on the back porch. All but right. yeah, so uh, Alfred Packer escaped from jail, and they didn't find him for a little while. But when we come back. We will talk about what happened when he came back, like the trials that he went through and stuff like that. And then we will talk also about the horrible, horrible, horrific story of the Donner Party and how they all ended up having to eat each other. They ate each other up, as Danny Torrance says. But yeah, so we will be back in just a couple of minutes. You doing, Boogie? (laughs) Loving on the studio lights, huh? That's why you gotta lick your booty? Okay. She always does that when I start filming her. She's yeah. like, oh, I'm on camera? Okay, I'm going to lick my butt now. Yeah. She's so classy. Just showing everybody the lights. That's how it works. I'm going to program that DMX. I got the stuff that I need to do it now. Okay, here we go. On a break in between... Uh, Segments of the show. Don't do it, Pookie. Don't do it. Don't do it. Oh, oh. Don't do it. She's like, I don't do it. You yeah. can't stop me. What are you doing, Pookie? What are you doing? Investigating the lights. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? You love true crime, I love true crime, and I've spent the last three years compiling a series of the most intriguing unsolved murders of the 20th century. It's called The Faceless Villain, and Volume 3 is available now. Featuring such fascinating cases as The Ketty Murders, The Carrie Babies Case, The Frog Boys, The Alcacer Murders, and the Anokashira Park Dismemberment Incident, The Faceless Villain, Volume 3, is an involving exploration of unsolved slang spanning the years from 1980 to 1999. Pick up your copy in print or ebook formats on Amazon, or download the audiobook version from audible.com, and get ready for a chilling journey through modern crime history. All right, we're back on this frontier cannibalism show. Yeah. Talking about old Alfred Packer. Yeah, I asked Jenny, so how much is left on this case? And she goes, I don't know, as much as left as is left. Yeah. That's what she said. I was like, all right. <laughs> It's going to be a long show. As it's much as a... is left, it's like as I would have been done if you hadn't like got off on like several long tangents. Probably. Now, see, now, now, but I still okay. have another topic, fuck too. It, fuck it. Uh, fuck it. Okay, I ain't going to say nothing. <laughs> it's just going to be the Jenny show. Well, I mean, you can say stuff. It's okay. just like sometimes you go off, but then you like complain because I'm like, you know, I still have like a lot of stuff I have to okay. talk about. All right. You know, that's all okay. I'm saying. All right. So when we last left old <laughs> Alfred Packer, don't you laugh at me. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right when we last left old alfred packer he had escaped from jail they didn't find his ass for nine long years no one really knows what he was doing all that time like uh to make money or anything like that i presume it was crime uh but they do know that he was operating under a pseudonym john schwartz yeah i think now, i changed my name too yeah well the yeah. stupid thing though is that how he got found like, he was in, like, Arizona, and he was, like, going, like, other places. But then, for whatever reason, he came back to Wyoming, and he was in a saloon. And a guy named Frenchy Cabazon, 
uh, was in the saloon, and he had been on the original. He was part of the original twenty one guys of the first expedition that mm-hmm. had gone to it, and he recognized Alfred Packer's laugh from across the saloon, and everybody knew that he was wanted. Right. So Frenchie like reported him to the police. So no one is quite sure why Alfred Packer, if he was trying to evade the authorities, why he came back to a place where people knew him. That it seemed like a dumb thing to do. Maybe he he thought nine years that it had been such a long time. Back in those days, it was hard to prove anything, and that's true. And there was a lot of transient population. So back in those days, so you know. He figured fucking he was long forgotten. Nope. That's probably He yeah. was incorrect. Yeah. So where they caught him was only 300 miles from the prison where he had escaped from. Like I said, and he had been to like, he said later that he had been in like Arizona and he'd been like far away. They don't really know why he came back. Maybe he wanted to get caught. Or like you said, he was arrogant and he just thought, oh, they forgot about me by now. Yeah. Because it had been nine years. So, uh, but they had not forgotten about him and he got arrested. But he got put before a grand jury who uh, returned five indictments against him for the hatchet murders of the five other guys. Because I guess they determined that that's how he killed them with a hatchet. Hmm. Instead of... I mean, I think one of them had a gunshot, but I'm not really sure about the other ones. Hatchet. Yeah. So, uh, at this point, he gives yet another version of events. What is this? The third one now? You're right. So, this is what he says nine years later. He says, now... Yeah, we left the camp, the Ute camp, and we only had seven days worth of supplies for one dude. And there's six guys on this fucking thing, so I don't know what the fuck they were thinking. But initially they said it was ten, you know, ten days worth. Now he said it was only seven days worth, and that was only for one person. So he says two or three days into the exhibition, in, into the uh, um, expedition, there was a snowstorm. And the snow was so deep that they couldn't get through it. And he said they went through all their provisions really fast. By the fourth day, all they had left was some flour. But they still kept on going. So he's like, they're eating like fucking plants off of shit. Like, you know, gum and stuff off their boots and shit like that. Um, You know, and... They started, he said that um, everybody started getting, like, acting kind of loopy because they were really hungry and stuff like that, even though it's only been a couple days, so I'm like, whatever. Um, He did say that they found a lake and they tried to fish, like, they cut holes in the ice, but they didn't catch anything. Um, At this point, he said that Israel Swan started to, um, you know, lose it and kind of, like, freak out and stuff. He told Alfred, according to Alfred... Uh, to go up the mountain with his rifle and, like, scout out the terrain. Can we go that way and shit like that? Um, Because Alfred was saying, well, at this point, I was, like, you know, the head of the expedition. I was, like, the guide or whatever. Um, So he goes up to scout, and he says all he sees is snow, and, you know, they don't know where they're going to go from here. They're totally lost. Like, the weather's really bad. And he said that Bell had been acting like a nutcase, um, just because they were all so hungry and he was starting to lose it and shit like that. So then, uh, Alfred says that he came back to the camp, um, to tell them, hey, dudes, we're kind of fucked. And at this point, he says Bell had already killed, uh, Frank Miller, the butcher, and was eating part of his leg. So again, he's trying to allay some of the suspicion from his, himself by saying, Hey, I wasn't even here. I was out doing some useful shit and I just got back and it, it was like that when I got here. That's basically yeah. what he's saying. I'm so, not buying this story. I'm right? not either. Well, like I said, this is like the third version of the story that he's given at this point and he will give another one like before the fucking thing. So he says that he comes up to the fire and that Bell then picked up a hatchet and attacked him and then Packer said, well, he shot him in the stomach and... Then he said, Bell fell onto the hatchet, Alfred picked it up, and then hit him, like, on the top of the head and, like, killed him with the hatchet. Then he said he was all bummed out about it, because, of course, this is, like, a very self-serving narrative. He says that, at this point, all the other four were, like, four of them were dead, and he was, like, gonna leave the camp because he felt so bad or whatever. And he said that he 
tried to bury them or like he covered them with snow or whatever. And, uh, but that he did eat off of the bodies that, um, that the other guy had already like prepared. You know what I mean? So he said that, well, I kept trying to leave, but the snow was so bad. So I had to like, just eat more of them, you know, like as the time went on. Yeah. And he said he lived this way for two months, uh, because he could only eat a little bit of human flesh at a time. He said, finally, there was a thaw, so he packed up some of the flesh, one of the guns, $70, which in today's money is about $1,600, uh, and just started going back to uh, the Indian agency or whatever in Colorado. Now, he said that he ate the last of the meat on his way back to the camp. However, if you'll remember, you know, when he first came back, they found, like, scraps of human meat, like, along the trail, so he couldn't really explain like why they why he left like scraps of human meat along if he said that he ate it all like on the way back. So again, this is another version of the story that mm. doesn't sound super uh, plausible. Now he did admit he said you you know you remember when we had that search party and I told you that I was going to tell you where the bodies were because I at that point I was saying that they were all spread out and they weren't all in one place even though that's the way they found them. He said, well, I didn't know where they were, but I didn't want you guys to find them. So I just like pretended like I led you to a different place or not far enough or like, you know, I didn't want you finding the actual bodies. So he also said that he had escaped from the jail previously by using a pen knife and like using that like in a keyhole and like kind of Jimmy in the lock and that he had been uh, in Arizona and Arkansas and then had finally returned to Wyoming where he was heard by a former colleague of his. Now, this was yet another confession that he swore up and down was true. He signed it and everything. So they put him on trial for murder in April of 1883. Now, this was only the murder of Israel Swan, one of the dudes, because that was the guy. He was the oldest guy. He was the only body that very clearly had signs of like a hand to hand struggle. You know what I'm saying? So they knew that his death had been violent and he had like fought his killer. Um, the dumb thing is that even though Packer said that he had shot one of the dudes in self-defense, that wasn't even Israel Swan that he said he shot in self-defense. He said that he shot, uh, Bell in self-defense. He didn't say anything about Swan. You know what I mean? So they, they thought it a little weird that like, it looked like, uh, Israel Swan had fought somebody like, and then gotten killed. That's a fabricated story. Uh, yeah, it is. All right. So they used, like I said, they didn't have any photographs of the scene, but they did have this very detailed illustration that this guy from Harper's Weekly had done. Um, so, and they were all very close together. Like I've seen the illustration. So they said all but one of the bodies had hatchet wounds to the head. Um, and all, like, it looked like the backs of the heads were like mashed in. Like he had just, maybe he'd done it when they were sleeping. I'm did not it when really they were sure. Sleeping. Yeah, like the one of the guys fought back, obviously, but that was the only guy that, you know, had evidence that he had actually fought back. So, uh, the weird thing is that fucking, they, Alfred Packer took the stand in his own defense, which probably was not the wisest move. They said that he was on the stand for about two hours. Um, and a lot of the shit that he said on the stand was obviously not true because he contradicted, uh, himself like several times. He lied about other things too, like just about his past, like about how old he was, like he lied about his military service, um, all this other kind of stuff. Cause he had been in the military, uh, but he was discharged a couple times, I believe because he had epilepsy. Uh, so he had, uh, gotten kicked out because of that, but he, uh, made up shit about that, that they later found out wasn't true. So he also, um, he came across as very, uh, in the sense that like, you know, people that are like pathological liars and they kind of come across as like overconfident or like condescending or something. He kind of came across like that. So I feel like the jury, not only did they not buy what he was saying because he contradicted himself, but also because he kind of came off as a douche. So they didn't yeah. really, you know, they, they weren't really feeling it. Um, so... Basically, he's trying to, this is a very self-serving confession where he's basically had an excuse for everything. It's like, you know, I came back to the camp and they had already killed the person and were eating them, or I killed the person in self-defense. It was always 
he was never entirely responsible. Like, yeah, I killed the motherfucker and ate him. Even though I'm pretty sure that that's what's hap- what happened. Yeah. He always had an excuse that it wasn't his fault. You yeah. know what I'm saying? He always kind of had Most that. likely, the, they were all in trouble. Yeah. And he was the first one to break unit cohesion. He says, I'm going to kill all these dudes and eat them. Yeah. So I can get out of here. Killed him and killed him. Tried to kill him in their sleep with a fucking hatchet. Yeah. One of them woke up during all that. Yeah, the old guy woke up right. and was like, "You're not taking me alive, motherfucker." Yeah, but that's probably what happened. I kind of feel and, like that's because they were all. I mean, from right. the sketch, the the bodies were right there. They were right. all very close together. Now, how much in trouble were they? Hard to say. Did they really only take seven days worth of food yeah. for one guy for six men? Could be. What you're talking about? I mean, you're that's talking dumb about like a pa- you're talking about a pathological liar type dude. Yeah, he definitely does come and, across like that. And he's one of those. They tend to be weak. Chances are the party probably wasn't as bad off as he thought it was. See, that's what I was suspecting and because how, they hadn't been gone yeah. that long. How much you want to bet? It was bad, but it was kind of under control. That's and the what other, I'm suspecting. And the other guys had enough experience to get through it. But he fucking lost his shit Mm -hmm. and said, we're all going to die, you know. But if I kill all these dudes, I can live. And that, and and he, well, that he lost his, he lost his nerve and went out there and fucking, you know what I mean? And fucking killed him with a fucking hatchet. Yeah. And all this shit about him bedding down or you're camping down. Nah, it's bullshit. He took all the flesh he could off those bodies, and it froze when he took it off. Yeah. He packed that up and fucking walked around and walked back with it, eating it the whole way. Yeah. Getting fat. <laughs> Getting fat. How much you want to bet? Well, yeah, because I think when he got back in town, they did say that he looked like fairly healthy. Fairly healthy. <laughs> and then he had all the supplies that were uneaten, too. Yeah. Yeah. And I bet you he had all the guns. Yeah. And probably sold them off. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine he probably did. Yeah. Because like I said, when he turned up at, you know, the the whatever center that was in Colorado. Yeah, he looked um, well fed. Well, no, what I was going to say mm. was that, yeah, you know, he had, as far as I know, he had one gun, he had a bunch of money and shit like that. However, people had seen him in town, like in a saloon or something like that, like a week previously. So he might have come into town much earlier And then kept it on the DL, and he's going around, like, cashing shit in and, like, getting rid of some evidence. Eating up some of that meat. Yeah, that's what I mean. Because they did find some human meat along the trail, even though he said that he'd eaten it all on the way back. No. I bet you he had that shit in town and was eating it, too. Yeah, I kind of suspect. Like I said, I it, it's hard to say because you know everything he said. Yeah, <laughs> everything he said was pretty much a lie. Yeah, but I mean, I'm sure there's a kernel of truth to it. But I definitely do think that he just like killed all these people I think the like, part, in I, cold blood. I think the party was in trouble, but it, but but he not was, in as much trouble as, as he, he thought made it, it was. Seem like right, not as much trouble as he thought it was. He was in serious trouble because he was fucking out of his depth. How much wrong, bet? Yeah. The other guys were more used to it. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, we'll make it. And he lost yeah, confidence. Yeah, it'll be he's all like, right, Alfred. Yeah, Chill the and fuck he, out. And he's like, no, 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 no. We're all starving to death. You know what I mean? And maybe, this, isn't, this isn't a Uruguayan right. rugby player situation. Might have been something like that. You know? Yeah. But so... Uh, now, the wrapped up feet and everything, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it was, but... I mean, it was cold. Yeah. It just seems to me that, like... Maybe they're yeah, reading, maybe that, they're reading into it too much. Maybe the, he stole their boots after yeah. they were dead, and it just happened to be that there was some shit wrapped around their, you know, their that's feet, true. Like, yeah, that. I mean, the first thing you would think was that oh, they ate their shoes and right. then they had to like wrap blankets around their feet. So maybe he just stole freeze. their boots. Yeah, maybe he did because boots were worth like a lot of money back well, then. Well, yeah. So, I mean, boots are important. Maybe when you're he just out trudging it, around. In it the could mountains. be that he packed the boots up. And pack those in a fucking rock. He could have done that while they were sleeping too. Right. He's like, I don't know, like some fucking, like a ghost. Well, he would have done it after they they were were. dead. Yeah. After he killed them, he would have taken anything of value. Yeah. And, you know, and hiked that back to a town where he could sell it. Yeah. So it could be that the party wasn't in that much trouble. They weren't eating boots. Actually, there's not enough time of it has elapsed. That's what I'm saying. It's like the time period that elapsed. It's like, yes, they... It was two months from the time that they set out to the time that he came back, but 
he's saying, even according to his tale, which I don't know, like, yeah. you would think that he would make it a longer period of time. Right. But maybe he wasn't that bright. I mean, he was saying that by the fourth day, they were out of food. No. And they were getting super desperate. And I'm like... And he's you saying can... by the tenth day, they're eating boots, right? Yeah, it's like, you yeah. can... No. I mean, I know that it's like, yeah, it's really cold and you need calories. You can calories go out a week with no, no problem. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's like not really that yeah. big a deal to go for that long a time yeah. without eating. It's not fun. I wouldn't right. recommend it. But you're not going to die, necessarily. You know what I'm saying? So and most of those dudes knew the ways of the fucking forest. Yeah. All right. They could get something to eat, even if it meant fucking digging out fucking bugs in the winter. You know, there's a lot of... They had little ways, you know? Yeah. To to supplement their their, their diet. Yeah. I just don't... I'm just not really buying it. I'm not no, I'm it. not either. It, it's not enough time. Now, if he's telling me, you know, six weeks into it, they're eating boots, maybe... See, that's what that's what yeah. weirds me out. It's like, you know, he's obviously lying. Yeah, three weeks into it, maybe four weeks. Yeah, so it's like, if he was just days. making up the story, you would think that he would lengthen the amount of time and saying, yeah, we hadn't eaten for like a month. And then I feel like he maybe would have gotten more sympathy. But the fact that he's just saying it was just like a few days. Yeah, because any idiot knows that in wintertime, you're not surviving without boots. How are you going to walk back without boots? Yeah, your toes will fall off. They'll fucking fall off within an hour. You know, you got frostbite within an hour. Yep. And then you walk on them and they fucking break off. Pop, pop, yep. pop. You know what I mean? Within a few hours. Frostbite. And those bitch. dudes have to know that. You know what I mean? So they weren't eating boots that, that you know what I mean, that soon. That would be like one of the last things. That would be the last thing I mean, like eat. I said, even the Donner Party... That was yeah. one of the very last resorts. Right. Like before they resorted to cannibalism, that was one of the very last things they yeah. were eating. You know, like they were fucking he stole their boots. That's what I'm thinking. That would not shock me. Like he stole all their other shit too. Yeah. Might as well have. Boots don't weigh that much. You can fold them, roll them up, and they're worth money. Yeah. So you know what and I mean. And like you I said, boots. I suspect that he came back into town earlier than he said. Yeah. And like cash. Was some shit. pawning shit and selling yeah. stuff and that's and kind of what I some said of that stuff happened. was boots. Yeah. All their like supplies and, Expensive shit. and, and, and other fucking, guns and stuff right like guns that. boots and because guns. all of them had firearms. Mm -hmm. So and as far as I know, he only came back with one or maybe two. Right. So what happened to the other ones? Yeah, those right. They didn't find any at the campsite, so he obviously took them. Right. But so, uh, yeah. So he got convicted uh, in April of 1883. Uh, of just the one murder, because like I said, you know, they couldn't necessarily prove the other ones. But since Israel Swan looked like he had struggled and there were signs of it on the body. So uh, they convicted him of that murder. Now, I love this, even though it's not true. But for some reason, uh, whenever you see this story retold, because a lot of like legends, like urban legend and stuff like that is like, um, you know, risen up about this story. The story goes that when the judge like pronounced him guilty... That he said, this is so fucking great, that he said, stand up, you voracious, man-eating son of a bitch, and receive your sentence. But it didn't happen. When you came to Hinsdale County, yeah. there was seven Democrats. But you, you ate five of them, <laughs> god damn you. <laughs> I sentence you to be hanged by the neck until you're dead, dead, dead. As a warning against reducing the Democratic population of this county, Packer, you Republican cannibal, I would sentence you to hell, but the statutes forbid it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That was what the legend said that he said. Not true, though. Not exactly. Okay. Um, <laughs> he might have said something like that. Mm -hmm. They said the court documents said that the judge said, close your ears to the blandishments of hope. Listen not to the flattering promises of life, but prepare for the dread certainty of death. Damn. Now, he thought that uh, the judge apparently thought that Packer had just killed him to rob them. Mm -hmm. And then just ended up eating them just for survival purposes. And that he maybe had intended to do that uh, the entire time. So, uh, yeah. So, he was sentenced to hang. However, that didn't end up happening. Even though he was supposed to hang. Ended up, he was in jail for two years. And then he got the right to a new trial. Because... What ended up happening? There was like this legal loophole type of thing. They determined they're like, well, he can't be tried for a murder um, in 1883 for a crime he committed in 1874, because at the time the crime was committed, 
Colorado wasn't a state yet. Right. So, so it's there wasn't. So it's not like you know it wasn't, wasn't within jurisdiction. Right. So right. it was like out of jurisdiction. And then right. there was also some sources too that said, oh well, maybe he was on Indian land when it happened, right. which would have been like not a federal. The States. Right. Yeah, yeah, it would have been like a federal uh, right. crime instead. So right. there was like this big fucking technical brouhaha. So they had to give him a second trial for the same thing. Now, the second trial. They actually can. They actually came up and charged him with all five murders, not just one. Yeah, now they're biting off more than they can chew. It's hard Although, to prove five. Well, yeah, but they still did it. Uh, yeah, they but yeah. they actually like reduced the sentence to voluntary manslaughter instead yeah. of murder, which kind of fits more the situation I'm thinking of, where yeah. he thinks it's with life or death. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So he actually did get uh, convicted yeah. of all five uh, voluntary manslaughters, if you want to call it that. He was only sentenced to 40 years. Although at this point, you know, he's in his 40s or 50s. How so. much had he served at this point? Five, six years? Two years. Two years? Okay. I think it was two years. And two they gave him years. 40? They gave him 40. That's still a death sentence back in the 1800s. That's what I mean, because he was already, I <laughs> believe he was already in his 40s or 40s, and the, I think, the at The conditions this point. in those prisons, you were lucky to make a fucking... Yeah. Ten year fucking yeah. Yeah. So uh so he gets sent to prison. Now, in eighteen ninety seven, he wrote a letter to the Denver Rocky Mountain News with yet another version yeah. of what had happened. This dude is just he can't fucking stop himself. Okay, well he's got he, nothing to lose. I know. So this is his latest version. He says that even before because, you know, if you'll remember, like, there was, initially, there was a party of 21 people, and they had traveled, and then they went to the Ute camp, and then it was only the six of them that traveled, because most of them stayed at the Ute camp. So he said, even before they got to the Ute camp, the 21 uh, group, the 21-man group, were already um, in a bad way, because they hadn't brought enough supplies, and their planning had been fucked up, and the weather had been bad, and whatever. So they said they even before they got to the Ute camp, they were already kind of fucked. They were eating the horse feed and all this other kind of shit. So they get to the Ute camp. Chief Ore tells them, hey, look, the mountains are impassable. You shouldn't go. And then he said there was this guy named uh, Lutzenheiser and four other guys. And they actually went on an expedition out before Alfred Packer's expedition. Now, this is the first time, as far as I know, that he's ever mentioned that there was a group of five that went out before them. You know what I'm saying? So this is a whole other, like, it's dimension. A new, this is a new yarn. This is a new wrinkle. Right, uh, yeah. yeah. Now, he said, well, the chief said that it was only 40 miles, even though it was 80 miles. So then this first group said they also ran out of supplies and then they did, like, the whole, we're going to draw straws to see who we're going to eat. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? Which kind of sucked because the daughter party. That didn't do that sound too. right already. But, um, but, yeah, so then he says that the first group, they saw a coyote, and so nobody got killed. And then they found a cow, and they ate that as well. And then they uh, found the guy that, like, the farmer or whoever, the rancher that owned the cow, and they went back to that guy's camp, and they got food and everything. And they... Um, so then eventually they kind of like, you know, ate and stuff, but then they kept going and then they just got like starved and tired again. And then Packer says, yeah, we, our party left about a week after his party left, but we took a different trail. And now he says the provisions lasted nine days. Was it 10 days? Was it seven days? Was it four days? We don't know. He says nine days this time. He says three days after the food ran out, they started, uh, they ate their, cooked and ate their shoes and wrapped their feet up in blankets. I'm not believing it. Yeah, see, he says this, so he's like, so it was heavy snow, it was like burying the trail, they didn't really know where they were. He said again that Wilson Bell like started freaking out from uh, starvation and that he started acting like a crazy person. Everybody else was afraid of him. So then they uh, go down to the Lake Fork of the Gunnison River and made a camp there. And he said the next morning he went out to scout and look like for a ranch or like an outpost or somewhere they could go. And again, he said when he came back to the camp, Bell was there by himself and Bell came at him and he had ended up having to shoot him in self-defense. And then he realized that all the other guys were already dead. So he 
No, this close. time he's close. saying that Bell killed all of them yeah. while he was gone, and then Bell turned on him when he came back, and he had to kill him. So he, so he's like taking less and less responsibility, yeah. like with every fucking iteration of this tale. He's going crazy in prison. He's full of shit. Yeah. So his quote was, "Can you imagine my situation?" It's like, yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's imagination, all right. My companion's dead, and I left alone, surrounded by the midnight horrors of starvation, as well as those of utter isolation. No. Oh, poor Alfred Packer. He's, that dude ate all he's those He's such days. a victim. Well, yeah. And uh, so <laughs> so he said that, well, since Bell had already, like, cut some flesh off of Miller, just like he said in the second and third iterations of the story, um, he's like, he saw that he did that, but he didn't eat it, because he's such a good guy. Right. He's like, uh, he's like, no, I'm, I'm not gonna eat that. I'm too good a person. Yeah. He said he just like he buried like all his friends, he's you know, lying. who were already dead. Yeah, it, like I said, each iteration of the story, he's getting like more and more. If you're starving and somebody offers you the meat, you do it. You eat it. Yeah. You're just not gonna think about it, especially when you're under. It's cold. You're suffering. You're like, yeah, yeah. You're dying. You're gonna, like, yeah, I'll eat that. Yeah. You're just now, gonna eat it, you know. And then he said, um, so then he said, well, at this time because of the isolation and i was hungry and everything like that so then my mind failed me oh yeah and i woke up the next morning and he's like and i felt really and i ate some of the food but it made me feel really sick and then later he's like i can't even remember if i really ate it or not which like i said it's just he's just like fucking making himself look better with every version of this story it's the hilarious only, the only thing he could have done after this is to fucking come up with another statement saying that he wasn't even there that probably you know, would have been the next thing. You know what? Thing. This has all I been a mistake. Go. I wasn't on that. I wasn't there. I just went off. I yeah. just went over there, and I just yeah. went to this other outpost. I was just. I watched the them go, and I was waiting there, and then they came, and then they came back, and when they came back, uh, they were dead. I, you know. Yeah. That. That was the. Next, I feel that like had he step. had he done another version of it, that would have yeah. been the next version because that seems like the next logical thing that he just yeah. like he he didn't even go. Had he come out and said, we were all dying, you know, two of them were at death's door, they weren't going anywhere, and the other ones fucking, they were fucking crazy. So we ate these two weak ones, and then the other two died, and I ate them. Yeah. And then I took everything. It was frozen. I mean, the thing and about people it. people probably would have been like, eh, it's probably frozen. Well, yeah, I mean, look, what yeah. happened with the Donner Party, it's yeah. like when, like, everybody, I mean, the thing about the Donner Party, though, was that there were so many more of them, so they had, like, you know, a corroborating story, so they yeah. all pretty much knew what happened because everybody's stories lined up. Right. Um their situation was a lot different because, obviously, nobody really wanted to do that shit. And it's like right. they went through everything before they got right. to that. Well, we're going to get to that in a minute, though. Yeah. Right. So, you know what I'm saying? But this yeah. guy, it just seems like, oh, and you're going to love this. Not only did he say, did he now say, oh, I got back to the camp and Bell had already killed them all. And then yeah. he came at me, so I had to kill him in self-defense. Yeah. He also said that his escape from jail. Yeah. The sheriff let me go because he felt sorry for yeah, me. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what? That, he said that. You know that jail? I didn't escape from that jail. They let me out. They let me out because he felt so bad at like my yeah, horrible situation. And it's like so you guys should too. And then like they would, then he would go like, oh, you know that when I said that they let me out, that wasn't even me in jail. <laughs> they actually arrested the wrong dude. <laughs> I just looked like that yeah. dude. I, that you dude know what looked I mean? like me. <laughs> Grizzled old prospector, I was we all look the same. Yeah, I was outside <laughs> eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I saw him run and I said, well, I guess it's time for me to leave. <laughs> I didn't even escape from jail. They had the wrong man. That's what I mean. Yeah. Like, this is just getting funnier and funnier like every single time. And like less and less fucking. It's Wasn't just, me. Yeah, it's just, it's just fucking funny. So, uh, so yeah. So he uh, gets, he, he actually, um, got put back in prison obviously he's so he's in prison the whole time he served 16 years in prison now what after he was in prison for 16 years he uh made a petition for parole uh the parole was denied however uh there was a reporter at the denver post one of the very early uh female reporters her name was polly pry and she got very interested in his case uh believing him to be innocent she didn't she didn't say that she thought he was innocent of eating the people. She thought that he ate the people, but she thought that it was like self-defense or it was like a desperation measure. She didn't think yeah. that he like killed them on purpose, even though I'm pretty sure that he totally did. Yeah, I think he killed them. Yeah. I, I did and too. ate them. Yeah. 
So she started a campaign to get him released, and she got the governor in on it. Um, now, he made another petition for parole in 1901, and on that, he was actually granted it this time because he was in, like, really, really poor health. Um, he had Bright's disease, which nowadays they would call, like, nephritis. It's like an acute kidney disorder. Like, mm. you know what I mean? Like, leads to kidney failure. So since he was uh, in such shitty health, they decided, well, uh, I guess we'll, like, let him walk around free for because he probably won't last much longer. Mm. So they did give him parole in 1901. And he was able to, I mean, he was able to, like, persuade, like, some people to his cause that he actually hadn't, you know, that he actually hadn't murdered anyone, that it was either self-defense or he had just done it because well, he was that starving time, or whatever. By that time, it was a long time ago, and he was probably like a relic from the past in terms of, you know, legendary. Well, so yeah. So there's going to be fucking people that are going to like, yeah, he was innocent. Yeah, you know what I mean, he probably, there because was, I think there were some people that maybe weren't even alive or were just little exactly, kids, exactly. like when the shit really happened. So, so they didn't just, really know. They didn't really know, and they're like, yeah, and he was just like a figure from the old west. Because talking about nineteen oh one already. Yeah, the old west was fucking kind of gone by that by that era. Right. So he would have been just kind of like something from the past that you could trip out on. You know, and that's probably what they did. They were just kind of yeah, let him go. Yeah, that was small west shit. You know. Well, and also, too, like, uh, guys from the Denver, the owners of the Denver Post, they uh, petitioned for his release, not because they thought he was innocent, but because they wanted him to be a sideshow freak yeah. in the Cells Floto Circuit. It's, so it goes on, it's, it's exactly what I said. Yeah. Because that's what the Wild West... Because they're what, having to go tell the cannibalism stories, because everybody wants yeah, to hear that shit. The Old West, by the 1900s, was something from a show. Like Wild Bill's fucking wild, you know, Old West show and all the, you know what I mean, where they're reenacting Indian battles with real Indians. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and fucking soldiers and shit. That's what it was. So he was an oddity. So they yeah. wanted him to come out fucking tell well, stories. Well, yeah. Which, you know, probably. Stories so, from a bygone era. Yeah. yeah. So they actually did let him out on parole and uh, he went, he moved to Denver and like uh, worked there at the newspaper. Like, I guess he was some kind of guard or something. They didn't put him in the circus, but uh, he did work there. He didn't like Denver. It was too big a city for him. He was more like a frontier type of guy. So he ended up moving to um, Deer Creek Canyon in Jefferson County, Colorado. Um, he didn't live too much longer, though. Uh, he managed a couple of mines and he would kind of go around telling stories about yeah. You know, the frontier and about the cannibalism and everything. Yeah, and how to survive. And Yeah, and it's weird because, like, a lot of people back then said he seemed like a nice old dude. He's just like this yeah. grizzled old prospector. Back in my day, we just, like, yeah. and we had to well, eat, he probably the, was a long we time had to eat the flesh off the thigh. It's yeah. like we thought we were going to starve to Well, death. a long time had passed, you know what I mean? So he probably he was probably a yeah, different, was different guy. Like, it's, it's not horrific when you have that much, like, yeah. <laughs> so many decades. Ah, a long time between. ago. It was a long time ago, whatever. It's, that, that's what happened back then. Right. You know, well, you having think, to eat a motherfucker. That's well, just I, look, I, look, I look back at shit I did when I was 14, you know what I mean? It seems like somebody else did it. Yeah. You know what I mean? If I... And when you think about it, not a single cell in my body from when I was 14 it still exists. It was replaced by another cell. Yeah. No, so you're... is that you? Or is that somebody else? See, that's else? something that like always kind of like, I always think about stuff like that. Yeah. I'm like, I don't even have the same. Yeah, yeah, you've been completely replaced. You've been completely replaced by that time. So by you a just clone have, of yourself. And you only have kind of like a vague memories of it. You that's don't remember don't everything. Really, I don't really remember. So was that you? I don't know. It's really weird to think about. It's like about. you it's grew like... another you. <laughs> in the same place yeah, as you. Yeah, and you grew another and you grew another you many times over. I know it's freaky. Yeah. So uh, in uh, late to 1906, uh, a state game warden found Alfred Packer unconscious within a mile from his home. Apparently, he'd gone for, for a walk, and uh, it appeared that he had a stroke or he had some kind of thing. So he ended up did uh, dying of a stroke in April of 1907. Before he died, he'd actually written to the governor to request a full pardon. However, this was not granted. Yeah, they're like, fuck you, dude. They're like, uh, no, you people-eating motherfucker. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, he did have a grave. It's still there. It was actually paid for uh, by the government because he'd been in the military. So there's like a little Alfred, and it has like his uh, military rank and everything like that. Um, and apparently there's like little pilgrimages and shit to his grave to his grave like i said they did cannibal the musical is based on him there's like folk songs yeah based on him shit like that oh i should mention too this is interesting and this is what i was talking about when i was talking about uh finding the bodies all together and shit like that 
1989, there's this law professor from George Washington University named James E. Stars, and he'd always been interested in the Alfred Packer case. And because no one was entirely sure anymore, because it had been such a long time, like where the five prospectors were buried, because presumably they were left where they found them. I don't think they moved them or anything. So he wanted to know if they were still there. So um, so they go to the place that's now called uh, Dead Man's Gulch, which is what they called it, where they found the bodies. Um, even though no one was really sure, there was like, uh, you know, there was a monument erected there, but no one was entirely sure if the bodies were still there or not. So he wanted to, they did like the ground penetrating radar and all that kind of stuff. And then he got like some archaeology students. He's like, we're going to go dig there and see if we can find the bodies. So July 1989, they get all the diggers out there and shit like that. And they didn't have to like dig very deep and they found all five of the bodies damn like right there and they're just yeah. like and they're just, I, I have a picture of it and they're all just like laying like right next to each other like wow. super close together there's like uh, they're all like right they're well preserved side by side yeah i mean they yeah. didn't have any flesh and it was skeletons, right. skeletons right, there's yeah. five skeletons but they were like right next to each other yeah. And so I'm presuming that the, you know, because when they went and found them the search party, like back in the 1800s, I don't think they moved them. I think they just buried them where they buried were. Buried them up, yeah. Um, so that's, so that's where they were, like Dead Man's Gulch. They're like, yep, that's where, wow. where we put the monument. That's Were it. they able to find out any more about how they died? Not a lot. They said, um, because, uh, they're like... So they didn't really find any wounds. It's like that one of the bones looked like it had a hole in it that could have been a bullet hole, but they're like, they couldn't really determine if it was a bullet hole or not because they're like, it might've been like a fucking yeah. animal bite. It could have been like lots of different things. Um, so, you know, right. three of the bodies did have a uh, blunt force trauma blows to the back of the head and had cuts on the uh, arms and hands, uh, which they said were probably defensive wounds. So that was two or three people that had fought back, not just one. Um, also they found some nicks on the bones that they presumed were from cutting off meat, cutting the meat off, uh, defleshing them. So, uh, th these people, presumably they came to the, uh, conclusion. They're like, even though we can't be entirely sure, but we're pretty sure that this guy just killed all of them in cold blood yeah. and then ate them. So they did rebury them. They like put them all in boxes and everything, like, and put them back in the same. They had like a big funeral and everything. Moral like of the story is, boy, should have told a better lie. Yeah, not a not a super good liar. No, not even a super from the good beginning, liar. like even back in the eighteen hundreds when everyone was kind of a dummy and didn't know yeah. anything. But it's yeah. like even then, like he comes back with this yarn, right. and everyone's just like, no, no. I think I think if they'd have caught me, I'd have told. Yeah, I ate them. I ate them all. So we were all at had the to. Yeah, had to, to. Had to to survive. We were all at the edge of death. None of us were getting out of there. And I said, fucking, so I just rolled over and fucking crashed, conked him in the back of the head. Fucking two or three of them were about dead anyway. And there was no way we were making it out of there. Fucking, you know what I mean? And then fucking, I ate them all. I needed it for the strength you to would have of too if you were you in that too situation if you were there, if you, that's what i was told you could even i mean and you probably would have got more lenience with the forensic uh you know situation as it was back then you yeah. could probably even just say that they had died of starvation or, yeah. or of exposure and you had just eaten them yeah i would say they you wouldn't even have to necessarily well, yeah, it might have been close to the truth I mean, you could say Maybe. that you killed one of them in self-defense because he was coming at you or whatever, yeah. but it's like you could probably have gotten away with saying, oh, you know, they were dropping that, dead. And chances of them believing you under that situation are very fucking slim. Yeah. You could have said two of them were already dead and the other ones were dying. So yeah. fucking... It I, just seemed like every time he told the story, he yeah. was taking less and less responsibility. Right. It's like, oh, it's, well, I wasn't right. there for one of them. I wasn't yeah. there for two of them. And then it, suddenly gonna, I came back and they were all dead. If they got you, you're gonna oh. fuck... You're, look at cat, that. Is that look. cat? Look at this. Right. <laughs> See it? Show, show it to you. Why do you want to show everybody your booty? Yeah. It wouldn't be a show. It wouldn't be a show without some cat without ass. Without some cat ass. Without fucking crazy. sticking her butt Why are you being camera? crazy? Sit down and be a good girl. There you go. Aw. There you go. She can see her little ear yeah. around the corner. What? Yeah. She, yeah, like, but that's she what, was playing all the way. That's words. what he... That's... I mean, you're gonna fucking get caught. You're gonna do time. You better fucking put yourself in it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it's no one's going to buy... Nobody's going to buy this shit. Well, I, I was, wasn't there. I wasn't there I every was, single yeah, time. Yeah, I wasn't even coincidentally. there. Coincidentally. Yeah, yeah. Conveniently. No. Yeah, it's just... No, I said on, I man. ate every one of them. Had to to live. I was starving. 
Yeah, and they d- looked delicious. You probably would have, instead of getting that tw- 22 years, what they say, 20-something years, 30 years? 40, they, 40 years. 40 years. Probably only giving you 10 if you said, no, I fucking ate them. Yeah. Well, yeah, because, you know. I ate them, could have had to to live. If you could they have, were, like like I said, if you'd have yeah. given them some mitigating circumstances, yeah. like, hey, I was starving, and hey. If I didn't do it, none of us would be they alive. They looked like little chicken legs bobbing yeah. around in the snow. So that was ins- you know how it goes. I was insane with hun- hunger. I was the strongest one, and fucking they were all going to die anyway. So fucking, you know what I mean? I did what I had to do to live. Two of them were already dead. The other two were at death's door. See, that sounds and like I a much more believable. And I ate him, and I carried it all with me to fucking survive to come back Jeremiah Johnson style. <laughs> and then you fucking, you know what I mean? On the way back, I had to fight off a bear. I had to fight a well, whole now. fucking. I had to fight off a whole fucking Indian tribe and a Bigfoot. Yeah, got married to an Indian bride on the way back, and then that bitch divorced me. I'm still paying fucking alimony for that shit. You know and what I mean? And then yeah, there were and they'd been sitting there, they'd been sitting there, sitting there thinking, mm, yeah, sounds sounds likely. I remember. The sounds Indian, legit. The Indian girls were yeah. <laughs> What happened? Okay, yeah, that's you should have just straight up broed that shit. <laughs> but he he pushed out. Yeah, I just I, I, I don't really, know why he thought anyone. Was I really think it, he but. killed the other dudes. From in reality, I think he killed the dudes because he was pussing out. He's like, well, yeah, like I said, like, it hadn't we're not been that make long. It. I want to go home. I think. It, I mean, I want to go home. Like that's I said, the shit that I was reading about the Donner Party, they survived yeah. a thousand times yeah. worse and for much longer. Than this little piddling expedition yeah, I here. Think, I think he was pussing and out. And half of them lived. Yeah, I think he was pussing out. And he wanted to bail out. Yeah, he's just like, and, man, this sucks. It's so and cold. he thought it was a lot worse than it was. And he fucking killed those dudes and ate him and got out of there. Yeah. They're Un- still... Probably unnecessarily. Uh, that's kind yeah, yeah, that's what I'm assuming. Like, I, I, I see. I don't think that he would have had to. Right. I'm not saying they all would have made it. And because, I'm just saying I don't think the situation was as dire as because he, he had that it. pussy element in him. He it behooved him to lie. He couldn't go roll with it. You know what I mean? So he had to come up with. Oh, I, I didn't. I didn't even see anything. <laughs> you know, the, I was there and I saw this big hairy man. <laughs> I saw this fucking big hairy man, and it looked like a wild man. It looked like, I don't know what it was. And then he, I saw its eyes, and it vanished. You know what I mean? Just, <laughs> he went off to the other dimension. He went off to the other dimension. And, and also... Didn't the, even leave footprints. Also, those drugs you found in my pockets, those yeah. were not mine. A so, friend you know, put those in there. I even Those aren't even my pants. I don't bl- even know where this shit He's blaming came. that shit on fucking Bigfoot. <laughs> See, yeah. that would have been, like, you know, that would have been really funny. Bigfoot did that shit. Bigfoot did it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's get to this Donner party. Yeah, we got to talk about the Donner party. Time for the Donner party. party. I'm tired of talking this about this other dude. We got him sorted out. <laughs> yeah, this... I, uh, I, I know what I'm dealing with this dude. This story, so depressing. Yeah. It just seemed like, this is just, uh, you know, an example of... I'm not going to say nature hates you, just like nature is indifferent toward you. Nature hates you. And al- <laughs> <laughs> and also, it's like one bad decision, like you don't even know it's a bad decision at the time, but it just like compounds and snowballs into this horrific, just giant clusterfuck of awfulness. Mm-hmm. I mean, just the worst shit happened. They had like the most rotten fucking luck. I mean, yeah, they made like one or two dumb decisions... Um, or at least a couple of them did, but it just seemed like this one tiny little dumb decision like led to like all this fucking horrible yeah, it chose shit the, happening to them. Like it chose on. the wrong route, from what I remember. That was the main problem. I yeah, think. it's you know shortcut. It, yeah, which wasn't actually right, but you know they didn't know that, and that was kind of like the sad right. thing. So this happened uh, earlier than our Alfred packer case this happened in 1846 now most people have heard of the donner party and i think if you ask most people to just like survey people in the street you ask them about the donner party they'll say like what danny torrent said Mm -hmm. they ate each other up which to an extent that's true but there's more to it than that there's a lot more to it than that like i said the i think the book that i was trying to think of earlier that they were talking about about last on uh last podcast on the left was called um the indifferent stars above and it goes like really, really into like 
no, just kind of the whole frontier experience, like going out west in general, but the Donner Party in particular. And it goes like really into like all the shit because they have like a lot of their letters and stuff. Because I think what I didn't realize, I learned about the Donner Party in school, but I had forgotten a lot about it. Um, what I didn't realize was about half of them lived. You know, they didn't all yeah. die. Well, actually, uh, what had happened was pretty well recorded by the survivors. It was. There was, like, everybody read, exactly what happened, yeah. like, pretty much from day to day. Even the names of the people who are standing around the fire that fell and knocked a fire over and mm-hmm. put the fire out on certain nights and shit like that. A bunch of weird shit had happened. Yeah, it's very book, well documented. I read a book about it back in the eighth grade, back at Southern California Military Academy coming up. And it tripped me out, the shit that they were doing. I don't remember all the details, but this I is remember the gener- general generalities. Story. You had a lot of people that weren't really, um, well, they were, they were what you call greenhorns. They weren't really used to being out in the field, most of them. They were the kind of people that would really be in a city. Uh, they were kind of more used to taking trains. But they had to go somewhere in a wagon. They got caught up in a fucking bad winter up in the fucking, win- up in the, up in the mountains and made a bunch, made, they made poor decisions uh, once they were up there. They should have just kept going or walking or walking down the mountains, but they decided to wait, and that was part of the problem. You can't wait. Well, like I said, there was a lot of things that went wrong, yeah. and it wasn't always entirely their fault because they were yeah. going on advice from people that they thought knew they what thought, they were talking about, but they didn't know what they were talking, they're talking about, about, and it ended up killing a bunch of them, which yeah. is really sad. So this happened in April of uh, 1846. So there were nine covered wagons leaving Springfield, Illinois. Now, this is a 2,500-mile journey out to California. Now, even though the party gets called the Donner Party, uh, there was a whole bunch of families, and the Donners were one of the families that were on there, but they weren't even, like, the ones in in charge, at least in the beginning. The head of the, uh, you know, wagon train at the beginning was was a guy called James Reed. Now, he was a businessman from Illinois, and uh, he had been wanting to go out to California. Also, his wife had, like, problems with migraines and stuff. And he thought, like, the climate out there would be better for her. So he ended up reading this book, which was very, very popular at the time. It was called The Emigrant's Guide to Oregon and California. Now, at this point in the 1840s, a lot of people that were going out west um, had ended up emigrating to Oregon because it was much easier to get to. Like, you didn't have to go through, like, all these, like, fucking inconvenient mountain ranges and stuff like there were easier trails up there so a lot of the settlers had like settled in oregon but eventually they started like going into california even though at the time it was much harder to get into and it now, was dangerous not to go in those mountains because the great plains indians were still around at that time too. yeah and uh, they were kind of like the damn pirates of the plains uh, you didn't want to get captured by them plains indians were badasses well, and they were always kind of like looking at all these like, they're like, hey, look at these white people that don't know yeah. where they're going. They have like right. a bunch of cool shit we could probably take. Yeah. And, you know, they were a masculine bunch. <laughs> yes, indeed. Even the women. By all accounts, strong and good looking people. Very fucking, very fucking intelligent. Well, they had been living well here equipped. for thousands of years. Yes. So they were like, they knew the terrain. They yes. knew. A lot know, of this shit about... The superior white man coming over here to the to the fucking uh, west and dominating Indians with guns is fucking pure Hollywood. That's not exactly what happened. Yeah, that, that the white the man case. got his ass kicked most of the time. You know, it was mostly disease and interbreeding, really. That well, they just kind it. of like blundered onto this continent, yeah. and they weren't used to the no. terrain. They weren't used to the climate in in some areas right. you know obviously it was much easier to settle like the northeast and stuff because it was a very similar climate to europe and that's what they mm. were used to but when they started going out west they didn't have any experience with right. anything like that right another thing that pisses me off is that a lot of these modern educate modern not of these modern so-called educated people are always talking about racism you know about how racist the white man was against the fucking indians that's all bullshit during the con- the writings of the time, especially going back to the 16 and 1700s, is nothing but just damn fucking um, a white boy's man crush on how fucking great the Indians were. You got to go read back how. You got to read the old literature, okay? Not any of this new shit. Fucking the Indians were far ahead 
of the white man. Well, like back I in said, they've been living here for thousands. They've been living here for thousands of years. They had their own technologies. They were very intelligent, and they had a lot of physical prowess. All right, they whipped the white man's ass for hundreds and hundreds of years down here. It wasn't until the Industrial Revolution, really, that the Indian cultures slowly were absorbed, and, and were di and basically, you know, disappeared. That's a that's a modern phenomenon. Back in this day, the Indian ran the fucking game here. It wasn't until fucking trains and telegraphs. Well, like that, I said, particularly out west, because yeah. that was just like a completely right. wild. And right. and a lot of the west back then was also still owned by Mexico. I mean, right. a lot of a large part of Canada or uh, right. California, rather, or Texas right. and stuff like that, were owned by Mexico. Yeah. yeah, right. So. Uh, yeah, so this book, The Emigrant's Guide to Oregon and California, had been written by this fella named Lansford W. Hastings. Now, one of the big things... Now, I'm not saying, like, this entire book was bullshit, because there was, like, some good advice in there. Like, hey, if you're going out west, uh, you can't leave any later than, I believe it was May 1st, because um, then you're going to end up in the middle of the mountains in the winter, and it's like, you don't want to do that because, you know, how long it takes to get through there, which was good advice. However... Uh, one of the uh, most famous and also most unfortunate uh, pieces of advice in there was he had come up with a supposedly new route to California that, supposed, that was supposed to be a shortcut. Supposed to cut 350 to 400 miles off your journey going to California and it was supposed to be like an easy trip. Now, what a lot of people that read this book, because this is a very popular book at the time, like a lot of people that were going out west were reading this shit and believing it. Problem, okay, there were two problems. First problem was that what they didn't know was that Lanford, Lansford W. Hastings had ulterior motives for getting people out to California because he had like this deal with a land developer type, you know, dude, like a company out there. And they said, we'll give you X amount of lots out here in California if you can bring, like, a bunch of settlers here to buy plots of land. You know, bring X amount of settlers here. So he's writing a book making California seem like it's this big paradise. Everybody has to come here and all this other kind of shit. Second problem was that uh, his supposed shortcut, the route that he, like, touted very much in this book, he'd never done it, like, in person. He just looked at a map and was like, yeah, that looks like that would be easier. Yeah. That doesn't work out. No. Yeah. <laughs> what uh, are they? Because the map is not lot, the terrain. Isn't that what they say? Throughout, throughout <laughs> history, many men have looked at the map and saying, oh, that should be no problem. Right. That's, Adolf Hitler being one of them. Looking at the map of the Soviet Union or Soviet Union yeah, or Russia, going, that oh, that'll go, be no problem. How'd that go? It's only this big. <laughs> <laughs> As fucking Eddie Izzard was like, oh, it's no problem. Oh, it's a bit cold. It's a bit cold. <laughs> yeah, it's just only that big. We'll just move our guys here. It'll be okay. Well, you know, we'll, we'll. Yeah, it's very easy to like move shit around on yeah. the risk board. Yeah, on the risk board. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that seemed like the same situation. This, it's like he apparently looked at a map and yeah. thought that he saw a route that looked easy, like yeah. on paper. And he wrote in his book that thousands and thousands of people were reading and buying into and going, yeah, sounds legit. Yeah, not legit. 350 to 400 miles off the journey and we can go out to California, this big paradise. Yeah. It'll be super easy. Throughout history, uh, many of the no. men that drew the maps weren't there. It's kind of like, <laughs> that's some funny shit. That's what I mean. It's like, yeah. I'm gonna do draw we this even map. know the map never that he was looking never at? Been there. He could have just pulled <laughs> shit out of his ass. They don't know. You haven't been there. You haven't seen it. And that's like kind of what happened with him. I mean, yeah. he did kind of like man up later and we'll get into that a little bit later on. Like he did man up later and go, oh, maybe I should like run this route and see if it actually works or not. Yeah. But that by that time, it was like too late to save the people in the Donner party who had already like followed this asshole's advice. So uh, James Reed, who, like I said, he was the one that kind of instigated the whole Donner, which is why sometimes they actually call it the Donner Reed Party, not the Donna Reed Party. That's a totally yeah. different kind of party, which maybe, it, I don't know if it's quite as horrific. I'm sure it's, <laughs> I, don't know, I didn't know Donna Reed when she was alive. But yeah, so uh, James Reed, he finds uh, him and his family, they find like a whole bunch of other families that want to go out to California. So he's like, okay, well, we'll do like a wagon train out there. We'll all go together. So they had the Donner family, 
uh, the Graves family, the Breens, the Murphys, the Eddies, the McCutcheons, the Kessebergs, and the Wolfingers. Wolfingers? Wolflingers. Um, they also had seven Teamsters, which was like the guy that drove the teams of animals. Um, a bunch of single guys. So this initial group that was uh, going on the journey was 32 men, women, and children in nine wagons, as I said. So James and Margaret Reed, uh, they had four kids. They were also taking Margaret's 70-year-old mother, Sarah Keys, who had... Can you imagine that shit? Well, she had consumption. A 70-year-old 70, 70 yeah. woman. On well, the country. reason that she wanted to go was because she didn't think that she would live long enough to mm. see the family again. Right. So she said, well, you might as well. She, she's like, Take I'll probably you drive. I'll die on a trip. Yeah, well, yeah. she did. Right. But, um, spoiler alert. But she she just wanted to be with them. You know what I mean? Because she was afraid that she would die without seeing them again, which you can understand that. So she's just like, I'll probably die on the trail, but at least I want to be with you guys like when it happens. So they did take her along. Um, now, the thing about it, James Reed, by all accounts, was a very um, imperious arrogant sort of dude um he was the one that had put the you know initial party together and he was just kind of like uh my way or the highway type of guy it seems like that's kind of how he comes across like in a lot of the shit also his wagon when you're thinking like little wagon like little house in the prairie like a little bitty wagon with like nothing in there no man this dude had the whole shit kitted out there was a two-story wagon it had like a fucking iron stove in there, like a build in. Had like the seats had like spring cushions in them. Had like bunks in there. It was like a fucking Winnebago on the shit. Okay, mm-hmm. like back in the back in the eighteen hundreds, Winnebago style. It was like that. So it was like super fancy. So all these uh, wagons were brand new. It was nine of them initially. Now they assumed from the outset that the journey was going to take four months. Okay, which. You know, that was about how long it would take, like, on the more, uh, you know, the more mapped trail that, like, people had actually taken and, like, had worked out and stuff. So they're assuming, like, four months. So they packed for four months worth of shit. So they go to, uh, the first place they go is Independence, Missouri, uh, which was where you usually went. That was kind of like your last big outpost before you went on, like, the Oregon Trail or the California Trails. Um, so, okay, so at this point, like I said, the, the Donners were also on here. This was George Donner and Jacob Donner. They were brothers, and uh, both of their families were on here. Uh, George Donner was 62. Now, this was his fifth or sixth migration. So he had done this before. Like, he wasn't a total... Yeah. Green know, horde. Yeah, or tenderfoot or whatever yeah. the hell they call it. He had done this several times before. Um, but he had been living in Illinois for quite a while with his brother, um, they said, well, this will be the last one. We're just going to go out to California. It'll be paradise and stuff like that. Unfortunately, yeah. it's funny. We talk about places like to... Illinois and these are boring places today, <laughs> but back in this era, this was, you're talking about like something on the map of the fucking Mad Max video game. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? These were wild fucking places back then in the United States. Yeah. And you're not talking about the United States as you know it. Many of these places weren't really states. Some of them were well, just territories. Yeah, they, none of and none of the ones out west were states. None of the ones, point. yeah, and really they were owned by you know the tribe tribes. It was Indian territory, it's all Indian territory, or, or Mexico. And these, yeah, and these Indians, man, were like something straight out of fucking Fury Road. And you know, you're not talking about some Hollywood bullshit Indians. These were, these dudes were fucking badasses. Yeah. They were the samurai of the fucking of America. And guns didn't really help you against them. Fucking, you know, through most of history, the bow well, was a lot better. Well, gu- particularly the guns back then. The guns back then were single shot. Fucking, yeah. It wasn't and then you'd have to like sit there and put the lick of fucking. Yeah, and during that time, these shit. fucking physical prowess motherfuckers just came up there and just beat you to death with a damn war club. <laughs> or a bow was fired a lot more, a lot faster, and it was silent than say a muzzle loading matchlock or flintlock. Guns didn't help you. Guns were a white boy thing. Yeah. Uh, on the battlefield, the gun was the weakest, worst weapon for a long time until the 1800s. Well, until they actually made good until ones they had that repeating worked. center fire <laughs> cartridges. You know what I mean, like the lever action carbine. That's really when you had the single shot. To was okay, but during this era, you know, 1840s. 
guns really weren't. Well, you get one shot off. They one weren't shot super off. accurate, and then it would take yeah. like how long did it take? Like at least a minute or two no, like, to depends, reload it. Depends on what it was. Depending on what type of gun it was. Depending on what it was, you know, a muzzle loader. You had to fucking drop. You had to get out a cartridge, which is a fucking tube, a tube of wax paper with powder and a bullet. All right, and what you did is is you fucking mashed the bullet in the muzzle. Okay, excuse me. You fucking broke the end of it and you fucking dropped all the powder in there down into the barrel. Then you took that piece of paper, all right, and you mashed that up against the mouth and put the fucking bullet in the thing. And then you used a little hammer to knock the bullet into the muzzle and then a rod to push it down to the bottom. And then you either had a match lock on the bottom that you had to fucking put some powder on or you put a the percussion cap on there, as you, you know what I mean? After you cocked the hammer back and fired, it took a while. I mean, I feel like even uh, if you got good at it, that would take at least a minute. Uh, yeah. Right? 30 seconds, maybe. I, I mean, I, I think I remember seeing, I saw like some show or something like that where a guy was like, who was good at it, yeah. was showing how long it took. I think it took him like between 30 and 45 seconds. And he was like super fast. Like he had done a, a like, muzzle a loading times. weapon was only good in a skirmish line, which is a huge formation mm-hmm. of hundreds of men. The guys in the back are reloading. The guys up front are shooting. Right. And they're rotating. Yeah, they had like a rotation. And they rotated You'd through. have to do it But like that, that was only in European armies out in European battlefields. So that's not fucking what you're talking about in the Old West. Yeah. You don't have enough guys with you to do that. All right. They carried those things because they were good for hunting. Yeah. They weren't that good for defense unless you had a bunch of them. Some guys would carry a rifle and maybe two pistols, and so you have three shots. Yeah. You know. Now later on, you had uh, revolvers. Okay, that were percussion cap. All right, that had five to six shots each. You know, and then a carbine would or a rifle would have one. So a lot of times you see them with like two revolvers and a and a and a rifle. But but all of that shit was fucking kind of like not practical. Because if it rained, all the powder got wet. Yeah, and you were kind of right. hosed. If you if you fired that shit off at night, the chances you've been able to reload it at night are pretty slim. Because there's no light. Yeah, yeah, you couldn't it's, see what you were doing. So Indians knew all this shit too. And the Indians had guns; they knew about them. They didn't like them. Indians didn't like guns. Well, for their situation, they're like it that's was just not, fucking bullshit. It was impractical. It was impractical and it was bullshit, and they knew the weaknesses of them. It wasn't until metallic case cartridges. That Indians started to adopt rifles, and they really went went for it later on in the uh, like you know in the later part of the 1800s when you had fucking lever action repeating carbines that you could load 14, 12 to 14 rounds in them, you know, in a tubular magazine and work the damn, you know what a lever action is? Yeah. Right? That was the AK-47 of its time. They loved those, all right, and they had lots of those, and they were the most expensive ones. And in the later part of the tribal era, the Indians had repeating carbines, all right, in a time when the U.S. Army didn't. They had single-shot rifles. So actually, most of the time, the Indians were better armed than the U.S. Army. Yeah. Because those were expensive. Which is funny to think about, yeah. Yeah, they, those were expensive, you know. But people forget, Indians had money. Indians were people. Yeah. Indians were not fucking wild animals. They were fucking <laughs> people. Yeah. Okay? They fucking could make money and trade... And they lived a good lifestyle, and they could afford the best weapons that were out there. And they were fighting for their culture, which is a mobile culture. Which anyone would do. Anybody would. But, you know, the advent of telegraphs and trains really fucking changed the scene. And by the time automobiles first appeared, that was it. You just... You're just not going to be able to traipse through people's fucking property. Yeah. You know what I mean? Fucking everything would turn into farmland by that time, and... You just Indians got jobs, and like I said, they, they, you know their population had been depleted by popu- disease and sh- shit like that. So yeah, they, so was, they weren't like as you know it was many numerous thi- as they. It, had we're been. talking about a three hundred year period. Yeah, of interbreeding with white people. All right, you could say Mexicans were Indians. They were just another kind of Indian, mm-hmm. and they were interbreeding with Spaniards. Spaniards, but interbreeding with fucking Europeans. Uh, disease, uh, getting jobs, changing of lifestyles. It just, over time, it just, you know what I mean? Fucking, yeah, I mean, just, it took a long time. But Go yeah. out right now and try to form a tribe and run around and hunt buffalo and kill people's fucking 
you know, <laughs> pets and eat those and go steal shit and see how long that shit lasts. <laughs> it ain't going to last. You know, the industrial age ended that era. Yeah. That's what got them. Now, you can say, well, they moved a lot of them onto reservations. That was actually kind of like the last remnants. They had ancestors before them that had blended in with white people too because not all not all indians stayed in the tribes and not all white people stayed with white people because yeah. we know this for a fact yeah we talked about this a lot on like the the, the roanoke show yeah and, like shit like and that. here we live in an area that is this used to be seminole territory yes it was. the seminoles were mostly irish well and a lot of shit around here is like has indian is it yeah the, uh, the Indian the, names and Spanish names. The Indian right. lifestyle back in the day was better than the white man's lifestyle. It was freer, more naturalistic. It didn't have so many rules. It was more healthy. You didn't have to live in a fucking city. Fresh water, fresh meat. The Seminoles were at least half Irish. And they had black Seminoles. Yeah. And you had Indians. So you could join a tribe. A lot of people did it. And uh, there was these fucking old stories about Indians capturing the white women. And so they go in there and take the white women away from the Indians. And then in the morning they wake up, the white women were gone because they went back to the Indians. They're like, it's better over it, well, here. Yeah. <laughs> There's, people fucking make these weird assumptions. People joined Indian tribes back in those days. It was a good lifestyle. Well, I told you before, I probably totally would have done that. I would have rather done that. Yeah. 16, 1700s, if you gave me the choice between being a white man or an Indian, I would have said, no, I'd rather be a Lakota. Well, particularly the, in, you know, if you were originally from Europe and you were used to that lifestyle and, like, yeah. you moved here into a into a climate and a terrain that was unfamiliar to you, yeah. it seems like you would want to throw your lot in with people that actually knew, like, had lived right. there and knew what was going on. Yeah. And, and had adapted to that particular And there were and a lot of the things that you grew up with, like the restrictions that were placed upon you because of society and religion would have vanished. Yeah, it didn't matter. And er, pretty much by all accounts the Lakota was where it was really where it was at. They were strong, very intelligent, they were well equipped, well dressed, they had their own songs, their own cultures. Oh, they traveled a lot. They were raiders. But they admired strength, and they admired beauty, and their fucking health was good. Um, they did things that by today's standards would be not acceptable. But it was kind of like life on the high seas. You know what I mean? The rules were different on, 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 on the high plains. Yeah. You had to survive a different way. Sometimes you had to take things, you know. But that's just the way nature is, you know. And the Lakota were predatory. But they also recognized members of their own tribe. You know what I mean? They had allegiances and shit. I, I get off on that Indian stuff, man. And I, you know, it's the same way with the Mexican Indians. You know, me and me and Jair are always talking about you know the Aztecs, Jaguar <laughs> magic and shit, Jaguar power. You know, growing up in South America and Brazil, you know, fucking seeing you know Indians and stuff and Central and South American fucking cultures, you know, ancient cultures. They were fucking badasses, man. They were fucking way ahead of Europe in in some ways, um, especially you know architecture. It's just funny. Stones. It's funny how they didn't really know until quite recently that you know some of the cities in Central and South America at the at the same time as like some of the biggest cities in Europe. I mean, were comparable yeah. in in size and architectural complexity. There's this fucking kind of like thinking that the Indians were primitive. Uh, no, not at all. Uh, they their technology was different, but the situation was different. Yeah, the, it's it's a yeah. different climate. I mean, it's a different climate. It's a different yeah. situation that they had to deal with. In general, there wasn't a big difference between the Indians and say like the Japanese, the yeah. samurai. They're about like the samurai. It was just a different lifestyle. Yeah, wasn't much difference. You know, I guess you could say the samurai were agricultural. Uh, most of the Indians were hunter gatherer. But, you know, they were still highly developed. Well, yeah. I mean, like you I know. said, they had gigantic just different shit. cities and gigantic yeah. settlements and stuff. It was just, you know, the, the climate was different. You know, the terrain was different. When, when Cortez saw the original version of Mexico City, it terrified his troops. They were It was huge. It was bigger than any city in Europe. Yeah. And it was painted in bright colors. You know, you're not talking about cheap-ass shit. It was well-made. And it was, you know... 
it seemed advanced. Well, even if you just see the ruins nowadays, they're yeah. like amazing. Yeah. They're amazing to look at. And they were huge bundles of fucking heads and decapitated heads and lots of bodies because they were doing human sacrifice. They were they were terrified, you know what I mean? Because of the religion, you know, you had to pay back the blood debt. Yeah. Which is, man, they were fucking bizarre, man, but that's you just got to see Apocalypto. That is abs- That movie is absolutely, that's what it was like. But that's the thing. It's like, if you if you look into people's, that's why I'm kind of like interested at, about people's like uh, religions and mythologies and stuff like that. Because if you look at the, you know, climate in which they live, you can totally understand why certain myths arose, why yeah. certain, why their lifestyle arose the way it did, because it just, it, it happened very naturally in the way that they, yeah. you know what I mean? It, Later it's very on, easy to see how a, that happened. After Cortez and his Indian allies had deposed the fucking Aztec, after the Aztec rule, um, Spain sent a bunch, bunch of uh, priests and friars to analyze what was going on, to learn the language. And they wrote a big old book that sat up in the Vatican for fucking hundreds of years unread. Okay, because that's how it was back then. They wouldn't read a book. Hey, uh, Pope, this is what's going on here in Mexico. He's like, oh, fuck that. Just file it. I don't have time I have for time to read that shit. But if you read that book, it's uh, the friars are going, you know, the Aztec religion, it seems fucking satanic and very brutal, all this human sacrifice. But every god that they worship kind of has a c- Catholic analogy mm-hmm. to it. Is that this is a this is a religion very similar to Catholic ways, and that you know, and because of that, we were able to convert them to 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 Catholicism, and that's where all this stuff like Macumba comes from. That's what I'm saying. If you look in, it's very that's similar. What I, I was just gonna say that like all the shit about like Haitian voodoo and yeah. all that other kind of stuff. It's they found it very easy to like graft Catholicism onto that because they're yeah. like, oh, they got it. They got that originally because oh, it was very saints, similar. Good spirits, bad spirits, saints. It was very similar. Trying to appease evil spirits to keep them off of you and giving offerings. I mean, to there's good only spirits. so many. Like I said, there's, there's only, only so, so many, many different, different ways you can imagine. Right. It. There's only right. so many. Like human brains are the same right. everywhere and right. at all times. So it's like we only go in like an X amount of directions. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it, they come out, like, it comes out a little weirder, like, depending on what your culture is, like, depending, yeah. you know, there's little differences here and there, but when you really get down to it, they're a lot more similar than they are. Yeah, different. and uh, kind of like this European snobbery about technology, which kind of fucking even goes on with these, some of these, some of the shit that I've heard about all, you know, at college-educated people say. The difference between the technology of the Europeans and the Indians during the 15, 16, 17, it wasn't enough to make a real difference. And if anything, the Indians had a technological advantage in some ways. It wasn't until the trains and telegraphs and and smokeless powder and fucking, you know what I mean, metallic cartridges. That's kind of when European technology was better overtook yeah. overtook it and that's industrial revolution before that time really you know the indians were doing it the old-fashioned way and that was really the better way well and they had a tactical advantage too because yeah. like i said they had lived here for thousands of years right. they knew the terrain they knew, they the knew terrain. you know so they had like a lot of advantages it was said even back in those days you could capture an indian and take him and strip him down totally naked and let him go and fucking you'd find him 30 days later and he had everything he needed yeah. His clothes, his weapons, because he could make anything. Yeah. You know. Well, that's what they did. They just, like, right. made everything out of their environment. Right. You know and, what I mean? And that's why they were trying to avoid them with this damn path that they were trying to do. You know, the shortcut. That wasn't yeah. a shortcut. Wasn't a shortcut. It actually, like, later on when they checked, it was actually, like, 150 miles longer. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, all right. So... The, the original nine wagon train with the 32 people starts out. There's several families. So they start out from Illinois. Now, interestingly, on this very same day that this party started out from Springfield, Illinois, good old Lansford Hastings, the guy that wrote the Emigrant's Guide to Oregon and California, he finally decided, hey, maybe I should actually like try out this quote unquote shortcut that I wrote about in my book that everybody's read and like now they're all doing it. Maybe I should check and see if that's actually legit. So he did actually, to his credit, even though he'd already published the book and like a bunch of people had like decided to do it, he's like, 
finally he's like, well, okay, well, I'll do it. So he set out the same day uh, to do the shortcut and see how it worked out. So we'll see how that goes. So uh, the original wagon train reaches Independence, Missouri. It took him about three weeks to get there. And uh, at this point, they resupplied all their stuff. Now, the next day, uh, there was a really bad thunderstorm, but they headed out anyway. A week after that, they joined another large wagon train, uh, which was captained by a guy named Colonel William Russell. Now, this was camped on Indian Creek, about 100 miles west of Independence. So the two of them, like, meeting up, now the uh, the group was, it originally started out with 32 people, now it's 87 people, okay? So like I said, Donner Party, I always had the impression, even when I learned about it in school, that it was just like a family or two, but no, it was like a whole bunch of families, like it was a shit ton of people and a shit ton of wagons. So May 25th, this whole train of like, uh, you know, all these 87 people, there was some flooding uh, at the Big Blue River, which is near present-day Marysville, Kansas. Now, while they were at this, they were waiting out the, to, for the floodwaters to uh, to subside, uh, old consumptive 70-year-old Sarah Keys died. Uh, you know, the one they had brought along. Uh, so they buried her next to the river. Now, to get across the river, they had to bury... This is the thing about the fucking Donner Party, and this is like back in the old days. You couldn't just like... You brought shit with you. But a lot of the stuff you had to, like, build while you were on. Because, like, if you had to camp somewhere, like, for the winter, you had to, like, build a cabin. Yeah. Like, you had to cut down trees and build a cabin. They brought tools with them wherever they were. Yeah, went. they had tools and, like, food yeah. and shit like that. But it's, like, a lot of that kind of stuff, like, shelters and stuff, you had to build it, like, on site. See a movie called Jeremiah Johnson. John yeah. Millius. Same guy who did Conan the Barbarian the first <laughs> one. And they show him doing this kind of shit. Yeah. How to build a cabin or a house without nails. You know what I mean? That's yeah. part of the thing. You could do it. So to get across this flooded river, they actually had to build, like, little ferries, like, to put the wagons on, like, to get across the river. So they had to do that. Uh, so they actually did that successfully. It took about a month, like, to get uh, across there. Now, there had been a guy who was, like, the captain of the wagon train at this point. His name was William Russell. But at this point, he's like, nah, I'm out. And he quit. Uh, so they took a... Another guy took over named William Boggs. Now... For the next month, it seems like they didn't really... I mean, it's summertime. Uh, they didn't really seem to have a lot of problems. Uh, you know, it seemed to go fairly smoothly. So they get to Fort Laramie, which was their next big stop, uh, on June 27th, 1846. Now, this was only a week behind schedule. So they're still doing fairly well at this point. And like I said, it's still summertime. Everything's fine at this point. While they're at Fort Laramie... James Reed, who was the one that had put the original uh, Donna Reed party together, he runs into this dude uh, who he knows from Illinois, like an old friend of his, whose name was James Kleiman. Now, coincidentally, James Kleiman had just uh, gone this new route that uh, Lansford Hastings had suggested, the Hastings cutoff, as they called it, or the shortcut. He had just done it, and Kleiman said, yo, it's not a good idea. <laughs> He's like, seriously, James, don't do it. It's like, we did it on foot, and it sucked enough on foot. You are not going to get wagons through there. I would not advise it. Okay? So here's someone tell, and he, this is this dude's friend. They knew each other from back there. They were both in Illinois. Yeah. He's been on it. Yeah. And he's like, look, we just went through with like on foot and with a couple of horses, and it sucked really bad in the summertime. You're not getting wagons through there. I wouldn't go that way. I'd have said thank you very much. That's Let's what I right mean. Around. You would think, but it's called fucking. It's called a fucking scout telling you, giving you the information you fucking need. Don't yeah. go on that fucking. He's path. like, look, there's a big fucking desert. Yeah. Why does like this motherfucker lie? Right. I don't understand. He's it. like, I've been there. It yeah. sucked. Okay. He's like, seriously, don't go that way. Yeah. James Reed, though, for whatever reason, he says I know. Like I it. said, everybody thought that he was like kind of. Uh, an arrogant douche. So yeah. I guess he thought he knew better. He's like, hey, yeah. I read it in this book right here. It was printed. Yeah, they know more than you. And written in this book, <laughs> even though the guy that read the book had never, never been there. Been there. But he's like, well, it's in this book, and it's like, I think that's the way we should go. So he decided they were going to go that way. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that was their first mistake. He was mistake. believing what he was One reading. of their first mistakes. 
Now, before Reed and the rest of the party had left Fort Laramie, this guy shows up and he had a letter from Lansford W. Hastings himself, the guy that had written the book. Now, in the letter, Hastings said, hey, you guys, I will meet all of you at Fort Bridger and I will personally lead you on my shortcut that I wrote about in the book, The Hastings Cutoff. Um, you know, so at that point, because that letter came from Hastings himself, the guy that had written the book, uh, who I guess they believed like had been on this route before and like knew what he was talking about, even though he did not. So a lot of the settlers were like, oh, okay, well, cool. He's going to meet us and he's going to show us the way and it'll all be fine. Um, so that's how that worked out. So what it, what ended up happening? So July 19th, uh, the wagon train comes to the Little Sandy River, uh, which is in uh, Wyoming. Uh, it wasn't Wyoming then, but it's Wyoming now. Now, at this point, there was still like a large part of the party that were just like, I'm just not, a, we're going to take the route that all the other settlers have taken that we know, you know, that there's outposts along it. We know it's been mapped. It's like other people have done it. So most of the wagon train took the safer route because it was a tested route. The minority of the wagon train, which ended up being the tragic Donner Party, as it came to be known to history took the Hastings cutoff, which had not been tested because it was supposed to be quicker, like I said, even though that's not how it turned out. So it splits off into two, uh, you know, contingents. Now, the way uh, the, the group that went off on the Hastings cutoff, they elected uh, George Donner as their captain, and hence it became known as the Donner Party. So they started going along the southerly route. The safer route was the northerly route. That had been done by like many other settlers before. It was mapped. Everybody knew that way. Uh, but this way was supposed to be shorter. So that's the way, they, the way that they went. So they get to uh, Fort Bridger on July 28th, where they were supposed to meet this Hastings fella. However, by the time they got to Fort Bridger, apparently Hastings had already left. But he did leave a letter there that said, uh, yeah, I was here. I left with another group. You guys should just catch up with us. Now, there were a couple of guys there, Jim Bridger uh, and also his partner, Louis Vasquez. And they said, no, no, the, the Hastings cut off. It's totally legit. It's totally fine. You guys are going to be fine. It's much faster. You know, it's, it's totally fine. So they, again, felt like okay about their decision. <laughs> So, like I said, you can shit on them for making dumb decisions, but you have to think that they were being given really shitty advice by people they had every reason to believe knew what they were talking about. Yeah. So, you can't entirely blame them. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Even though... I. I feel like if it was me, I probably would have been like, yeah, let's go with the safer route, which a lot of the wagon train did. Like most of them went on the the tested route that had been done like a lot of times before because yeah. they thought that their odds would probably be better. Yeah, you err on the side of caution. That's what I'm thinking, like especially in this kind of situation. So, uh, so they decided, so they're like, okay, well, it's all going to be fine. So they stay at this, at this fort. For a little while, like getting wagons fixed, like stocking up and resting and all this other kind of shit. So July 31st, they leave Fort Bridger. Um, and this was now a group of 74 people and 20 wagons. Now, for the first week, it seemed fine. They were actually making, it was, you know, the weather was good. They were making really good progress, 10 to 12 miles a day, which was actually uh, quite good in those circumstances. In those days, yeah. yeah. So August 6th. They get to the Weber River. Now, when they get there, they found another note from Hastings who said, yeah, um, don't follow us down Weber Canyon because it's impassable. However, there is another trail through the Salt Basin, so I would suggest that you take that instead. So they're finding little notes from this dude, like who's going up and going, Oh, this trail is not what I imagined at all. And uh, he's trying to warn them, you know, in in his defense, he is trying to warn them. But it was his stupid idea that set them out on this route to begin with. 
So uh, at this point, so they decide they camp out uh, near what is now Hennifer, I guess is how you pronounce it, Utah. Now, James Reed, who was the initial, like, uh, you know, organizer of the party, him and two other guys decide they're going to go out on horses and they're going to try and find Hastings because he's like, you know, a couple stops ahead of them. So they actually did end up finding Hastings' party uh, on the south shore of the Great Salt Lake. And Hastings came back with Reed, like, partway back. And he, like, tried to show them where, like, the new route was. He's like, well, you go this way. It'll probably be about a week, right? Now, at this stage, uh, another family, the Graves family, who had been with them but had fallen behind, uh, they caught up with the Donner Party as well. So now there's 87 people in 23 wagons. So then they decide, okay, so they're going to take a vote about which way they should go. Like, should we just go, like, backtrack and take, like, the safer way, or should we go this new way? And apparently the majority said that they should try this new trail rather than going all the way back to Fort Bridger and, like, setting out on the safe trail from there. So they decide they're going to go the new trail, much to their ultimate, ultimate detriment. So August 11th, the wagon train starts out through the Wasatch Mountains. Now, this was like a very, uh, it was like thick forest. They had to like cut trees out like t- to make the way. There wasn't a path as so it wasn't such. a road. They had to like make one. Terrible. So they were making very, very slow progress. So they yeah. were doing like maybe two miles a day <sighs> if they were lucky, which, yeah, That's it's nothing. bad. It took them six days to travel eight miles. Oh, man. Yeah. You die of starvation just doing that. Well, yeah, this is just the start of their problems. It gets, like, way worse. So, at this stage, they're like, okay, well, we're not going to be able to get all the... This is a lot of wagons. This is 23 yeah. wagons. They're like, we're not going to be able to get all the fucking wagons through here. This is, like, a huge ordeal. Um, so, we might have to leave some of them behind. And at this point, everyone's starting to get a little cranky, uh, yeah. as they would. And they're starting to, like say you know what the fuck like hastings is a stupid motherfucker like told us to come this way and it was fine and also they started getting a little pissed off at james reed because he was the guy that was like yeah we should totally listen to this book and go this way because he was the one that had kind of made the decision for the whole entire party and for you people who are not americans the distances they're talking about and the speeds that they're going two miles a day having to cut down brush to get the wagons through it you're talking about a journey equivalent to going to the fucking moon. This Pretty is much. something that's going to take forever. There's not a road. There's, There's no road. A... Okay. It's wilderness. I would have fucking turned right around. It's wilderness. I would have turned right around. It almost yeah, seems like, a, I mean, of all the horrible things that happened to these poor people, yeah. like on this fucking trail, I feel like there was a, a an aspect of the sunk cost fallacy going on. It's like once you get so far... They're like, well, like, we have we're not to keep. Giving up now. We yeah. have to keep. We've come so far. We had yeah. to go through so much shit. We yeah. have to keep going forward. Yeah, don't get into. We that. don't want to like go back. Yeah. Because it feels like you're defeated, or it feels many, like you're like going. Many but, people have died because of that effect. No, well, many people turn, did die in this turn situation. The fuck around. They probably should have. Yeah. And 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 at one point it was like it was just too late yeah. to do that, which is sad. But it's like, it it was just like. Like I said, it was one of those things where it's just all these like tiny little bad decisions. Yeah. And it wasn't necessarily just that they were stupid. It was just that, well, somebody who apparently knew more than them was like telling, was giving them bad advice was what was happening. And they listened to it, which in hindsight, we can say, yeah, they shouldn't have done that. But I wasn't there. So it's like, I don't know how convincing that dude was. I don't know. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. So August 25th. So like I said, everyone's getting like really, really crabby at this point. Like starting to get really pissed off at James Reed. Starting to get pissed off at the dude that wrote the book. um, For leading them on this fucking arduous journey when it didn't need to be. August 25th, another guy in the group dies. Luke Halloran. Uh, He died of consumption. That was near Grantsville, Utah. Now at this stage, uh, the food and the provisions and stuff like that are starting to uh, run low, and everyone is starting to get a little bit worried. Uh, they had been it had been twenty one days since they had stopped at the Weber River, and they had only gone thirty six miles in those twenty one days. 
which that's not good. That's not far. No. I can walk that in a day with a fucking rucksack on. Yeah. That's bad. I mean, if you really had to, you could walk that yeah. in a day. Oh, we used to do 12, not really a big problem. I mean, I walked seven or eight miles in one day yeah. just accidentally because I was lost. Yeah. <laughs> depends on the tra- it depends on the train. My feet hurt, but yeah. that was about it. <laughs> I don't 30 a day, of, no, I probably couldn't do it. Depend, depend on how, how much I was carrying and the terrain. But, you know, 20, that's not, that's doable. Yeah. That's doable. You know, especially on flat terrain. And I think they're basically flat. They're just talking about women. No, I guess they're not, aren't they? But this is mountains, It's man. mountains, yeah. They're all out in the mountains. This Why is the fuck west. are they trying to get down wagons through that? Because they thought it would be easy. The fucking dumbasses. Well, they, I mean, they didn't know. Like I said, the guy said, oh, this is an easier route. It's shorter. Yeah, but in, but when you they didn't see know. what you're seeing, okay, They'd you, be go, like, you no, go, nah, let's go no. back. Yeah. Let's go the way that everyone else is going. Yeah, that's what I would do. I mean, that's what I would have. I, I like to think that had I been in that big group, right. and when they split off, I'd have been like, yeah, I'm going this way. I'm, I'm not going my, this I'm way. packing my bag, and so I'm walking back. <laughs> it's like yeah. fuck this I'm out yeah. but yeah five days later August 30th they start to cross the Great Salt Lake Desert now they believed because Hastings had told them that this journey across the desert would only take two days yeah uh, so what they uh, failed to realize though that the sand and this is still summer this is so what this wasn't as worse it was going to get like as bad as it was going to get because like winter weather coming and in where is like this that. again to salt lake where this is in utah utah yeah okay so uh the desert sand is very deep and like wet so the wagons going across it would like sink like down into the sand which slowed them down considerably now they had only they were crossing the desert on the third day their water supply was almost gone. And James Reed's oxen were like, we're out. And they ran away. Damn. <laughs> because they were smarter than the people, evidently. <laughs> wonder what happened to them. I'm sure they probably wandered off and died. But died, they were yeah. ju- they were probably just like, yeah, fuck we don't want to. Fuck all this. I don't, <laughs> I'm going to go. It's got to be better than this, wherever. Yeah. But it's like, yeah. So, they, so the oxen, a lot of the oxen took off. So they finally, it took them five days to get across the desert. They thought it would only take two. So it took them five days. Now, for uh, they actually got to the base of Pilot Peak on September 4th and rested there for several days, like they camped out there. Now, this uh, the trek across the desert, which was 80 miles, uh, during that trek, they had lost 32 oxen. Damn. James Reed had had to abandon two of his wagons, and the Donner family and the Kesseberg family had lost one wagon each. They had to leave them in the sand because they couldn't get them out. The oxen are like, what the fuck are these people doing? That's what I'm saying. The oxen were kind of smarter than the people in this. They're like, you know what? We'll probably die over here, but Damn. it's like, yeah, this is not. Because like, if we stay here, we're probably going to get eaten by the people, right. so we're just going to go yeah. over here. I think I'd have been eating some oxen at this point. Well, they did end up doing that yeah. later on. But uh, several of their oxen did run off because they probably knew what was coming. Yeah. Like I said, the oxen were, were very smart. So they get to the far side of the desert and they take a stock of all their food inventory. And uh, they found that they had some left, but it wasn't going to be enough because they still had 600 miles to go. Fuck. And they're like... Yeah, we don't have enough for that. Yeah. Um, and uh, also, around this was like early September, also they noticed that it had started to snow lightly oh, in the upper parts of the mountains, which, you know, it's never a good sign. Because like I said, up in the mountains, up in that high altitude, you're going to get start getting snow. I think I'd have taken the easy way. Very back. early in the year. Yeah. Oh, this is just going to get worse and this worse. This is why they time. built that big train. <laughs> Much easier than this yeah, bullshit. big railroad, Seriously. remember that? Yeah. So they get to the Humboldt River on September 26th, which is my birthday, actually. So what ended up happening then? They're like, okay, so our supplies are running low. So two of the guys who were traveling with the party, William McCutcheon and Charles Stanton, they said, okay, well, you guys go ahead to Sutter's Fort, California, 
Like, you just go by yourselves and bring supplies back to the party. So, apparently, the... Okay, so the two of them, like, took off. Now, from September 10th from the 25th, the party had been following the trail into Nevada through the Ruby Mountains. They had got to the Humboldt River on September 26th, as I said. Now, here, the new trail met up with Hastings' original path. Now, this was an extra 125 miles. Now, like I said, Hastings had originally promoted this trail as being 350 to 400 miles shorter. However, it was actually 125 to 150 miles longer. But they didn't know that at the time. Because, like I said, this was, like, unmapped and untested. So... Okay, so the Donner Party, as it was then called, they get to the junction with the California Trail about seven miles west of present-day Elko, Nevada, and spent the next two weeks traveling along the Humboldt River. At this point, because food was scarce and they had been together for a very long time under very poor conditions, everyone was starting to get a little grouchy, as you can imagine. And uh, was starting to, like, fight with each other and kind of get it, you know, get on each other's nerves. October 5th, they're at Iron Point. Two wagons kind of, like, hit each other, became, like, kind of, like, tangled up at some point. Like, I guess one hit the other one and they couldn't pull them apart Well, they got all the horses, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or oxen. Yeah. So, one of the Teamsters, like the guys that, you know like drive the teams of animals whose name was John Snyder. He starts whipping the remaining oxen to like try to get the wagons apart. James Reed, the one time leader of the group does not like that the guy is whipping the oxen. So he decides that he's going to stab John Snyder yeah. in the stomach. He was an animal rights advocate. So leave them he fucking oxen mad. alone. You bitch, you. Fucking stabbed him. And he stabbed him in the stomach. Yeah. Which killed him. Yeah. Now. They were at the fucking end of their wits with this shit. They were, yeah, they were over it. Yeah. Let's say that. They were over it. Now, the party convenes and they're like, okay, well, what are we going to do about it? It's like he just murdered a dude. And he's like, bring it on. What are you going to do? Well, now, like one of the guys in the thing said, hang it, hang the motherfucker. Right. But most of the other people in the party were like, well, we don't really, they weren't that far gone yet. So they're like, well, maybe we should just banish him, which is essentially the same as killing him because right. you're sending him out on his own it, it, on the, in desert. the wilderness, like in the untamed wilderness. So that's what they did. Uh, they sent him, like his family was still in the party. Yeah. You know what I mean? But they were like, yeah, you get the fuck out. So they sent James Reed away. Him and like one other guy. So the party keeps traveling along the Humboldt River. uh, And at this point, like the oxen that they had left, because like I said, a bunch of them had like run away because they were smart. The ones they had left were like really worn out. So they were trying to walk instead of, you know, getting like riding, like getting the oxen to like pull the wagons or whatever. So just to spare the animals and to keep them from getting exhausted. So these people are like, walking like next to the oxen yeah and shit like that so two days after john snyder was killed um another guy got turned out of the group now this was uh an older guy a belgian fella named hardcoop now he apparently could not keep up with everybody because he was older and his feet were swollen from all the walking so He started going around to, like, the other wagons and, like, trying to get them to, like, give him a ride and stuff, but nobody would. Damn. So, uh, one of the guys, like, one of the patriarchs of the families, Louis Kessenberg, said, like, yeah, well, you just stay here. So, they left the old guy by a tree. Damn. And then they just... Left him to die. They left him to die, essentially. Because they said, well, you can't keep up, so, bye. That's what they did. It was was getting to that point. It was getting to that point. Um, Yeah. October 12th. Where if they ever found his body? I don't know. Bet you not. I probably not. Like, you know, the wilderness is very, very large. Yeah, something ate him. I would assume. Yeah. October 12th, 
Uh, their remaining oxen were attacked by Paiute Indians, uh, who killed 21 of them with poison-tipped arrows. Damn. Just because they were like, eh. Told you about them Indians. They weren't fucking playing. Yeah. They they didn't like it. Yeah. (laughs) October 16th, four days later, they reached the gateway to the Sierra Nevada on the Truckee River, right around present day Reno, Nevada. Uh, almost all of their food was gone at this point. Now, three days later, on October 19th, one of the dudes, because remember I said they sent the party out to Fort Sutter, California, mm-hmm. and said, hey, go get supplies and bring them back? Charles Stanton, one of the guys, he actually did come back. He came back, and he had seven mules, and he had, like, a whole bunch of beef. He had some flour. He had two Indian guides, and he said, okay, well, I have, like, there's a path through the Sierra Nevada. It's hard, but you can do it. You know what I mean? Like, it's not super bad. So he came back with, like, good news. So everybody was like, hooray. Now, what had happened, the other guy that they sent out with Stanton, uh, William McCutcheon, he had actually gotten sick, and he was still uh, at the fort. You know what I mean? So he didn't die on the trail or anything like that. He was fine. But he was just too sick to come back. So the whole uh, wagon train, they camp out for five days, uh, 50 miles from the summit of this mountain, because they said, well, we have to go up the summit of this mountain to get it. And the oxen like have to rest because this is going to be like a hard push. Now, the problem was that because they waited so long, um, and this was another thing too, they set out a little bit later than even like when they when they first set out on this journey they set out like probably a week or two later than they should have which was another thing that contributed to because if you wait too long you know you're going to be in the worst uh terrain in the worst part of the year you know what i mean and people had done that so they were just like hey don't leave later than like may 1st because then you're going to be up in the sierra nevadas in the middle of winter and you're just going to get buried in the snow. And that's no fun for anybody, like I said. So that was another thing. But so so they're waiting and they're going to go, you know, rest in the ox. And they're like, okay, we're going to make this final push over the mountain. Everything's going to be fine. Now, October 28th, uh, James Reed, he gets to Sutter's Fort in California. He meets up with William McCutcheon, the guy that they sent out earlier who was sick and who had been sleeping at the fort. Uh, he had gotten better. So they said, okay, well, we need to get all, like, all our shit together. Because like I said, James Reed had been um, thrown out for killing that guy. So he's like, all right, well, we're going to like stock up on supplies and we'll go back to it. Because their families were still back in the wagon train. They weren't just like single dudes or anything. So they had a reason to go back. Like their wives and children were still back with the wagon train. So they're like, okay, well, we're going to get, we're going to get stuff and we're going to go back. Now, wagon train continues to the base of the summit. George Donner's wagon axle broke and they ended up falling behind the rest of the party. 22 people, uh, this would be the Donner family and some of their hired uh, dudes, they stayed behind while the wagon was repaired. Now, unfortunately, and something that would come back to bite them in the ass later on, um, George Donner was trying to cut timber for a new axle and the chisel slipped and cut his hand open. So you um, tell me, infection got him. Infection. Yes. Okay. And it got infected. Like, later on. Yeah. Well, it got infected later on so bad that he couldn't. But, but for a time, he couldn't use it. So he right. was essentially one-armed. Right. Um, which is not good in this situation because you need to, like, cut trees and fucking shit like that. So this that whole mission's it, a cluster. That's fight. what I mean. Every it, Like, everything just, like, it just built and built. It seemed like God hated these people. If there, if there was a God, he hated these people because <laughs> everything that could go wrong went wrong. Damn. And it's like just little shit. Oh, yeah. my wagon wheel broke. Oh, I'm going to fix it. Ah. Oh. Right, yeah. And then, and then he can't use his arm. Right. You know what I mean? And then like it got infected. It's, like, oh, it's terrible. So the party keeps going. Uh, they get to uh, a lake, which actually is now known as Donner's Lake. It wasn't called that then. Uh, and then it starts to snow. <laughs> So Charles Stanton and the two Indians who were traveling with them, uh, you know, who were their guides, they kind of tried to scout ahead to the summit, but they couldn't really go any farther than that because the snow was starting to fall. 
So they pretty much, they, they started going back there like, look, man, it's like already five feet of snow. This is not a good situation. Now, the pass through the Sierra Mountains was very narrow. It was only 12 miles from where they were camped. However, the snowfall was so heavy and they had so many wagons and this pass was so narrow, they couldn't get through it. So essentially they tried and then they were like, yeah, fuck that. So then they went back and they had to camp out at the eastern end of the lake, um, you know, where the ground was flat. There was like a bunch of trees and shit. Now, where they uh, camped out, there was actually one cabin that had somebody had built there like at some other point. I guess it was some other settler. So they're like, okay, well, we'll take that one over. And then they had to like cut down a bunch of trees and build like some other shelters for people to stay in because they're like, look, we're not going anywhere. So we have to build some shelters to stay in for, to wait this storm out because just, it was just feet and feet of snow, like dumping on them. So they built two more cabins, uh, which had to house. So these three cabins, like one that was abandoned and two that they built, uh, was housing 59 people. So you can imagine how many people are crammed into each cabin. So, and it, it, 59 people, man, I would imagine that they're leaning heavily on one another too. Mm-hmm. They're not doing anything to help the situation. They're trying to wait until somebody else does it. How much you want to bet? I've seen that before. I don't know. It really does seem like most of the people in this situation, from everything that I read, um, most of these people had done these types of things before, maybe not in this exact terrain, but a lot of them had like, you know, traveled around and, like, been settlers in other places and, like, built their own cabins and shit. They weren't, like, clueless. But it does seem like a lot of shit. And like I said, this winter... Leaving a dude behind is pretty fucking low. Well, they probably figured, look, he's old. Yeah. Which is sad, but that's probably what they thought. You could have just put him up in a damn fucking, you know I don't know why they didn't just throw him in the wagon. Throw him in the back of the wagon. Well, the thing is, I think they were trying to preserve the oxen. And at that point, I think they thought that the oxen were more valuable than an old man would be. Because at least an oxen can pull a wagon. How much could that bitch have weighed, though? I bet you that bitch didn't weigh 130 pounds. You could have put him in there. Yeah, that I'm sure white. he wasn't like some 500 pound yeah. man. And that that not fucking like oxen wouldn't even know the difference. Maybe not. Yeah, that does seem like kind of mm. shitty. It it seems kind of shitty. Like I said, they made some shitty decisions later on. But and you could always like, rotate him. Yeah, you, you could like I mean? move him because there was a you lot of like, wagons. You'd be in this one for today, and tomorrow you'd be in the other wagon. There was yeah. a lot of wagons. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's 59 people staying in three cabins. And it just keeps snowing and snowing. So, and they had to build, like, some other shelters out of fucking... He would have died later on, though, now that I'm thinking about it, during the starvation period, but fucking... Well, yeah, because the older died people anyway. died first. Right. And as you will see, almost all of the people that died on this expedition were men. Most of the right. women survived. And hmm. a lot of the children survived, too. Hmm. But, um, yeah, so they had to build other uh, shelters, too, out of just, like, anything they had. Like, fucking quilts, uh, buffalo hides, fucking tents, shit like that. So they're all just kind of, like, hunkering down. They're like, okay, well, we're just going to camp here because, obviously, they couldn't go any further. There was only this one narrow pass. You know, that was the only way out. And they couldn't navigate it uh, because it was too small and it was, like, covered with fucking snow. So they actually made two more attempts to get over the pass. Uh, At this point, the snowfall was 20 feet deep. Um, And at this point, they're like, yeah, we're not going anywhere. So they started constructing more small cabins. Um, Next four months, uh, pretty much they just hunkered down in this one area. Four months. In these little fucking cabins and like just tried to like build little shelters out of like whatever they had. Damn. Like they built cabins. They had like little lean tos, like what made they of fucking eating? quilts and shit like that. Oh, you'll see. Okay. <laughs> so at this stage, uh, James Reed and William McCutcheon, who, like I said, had gotten to uh, to California and were coming back, like to meet up with their families, they were uh, attempting a rescue mission. 
Now, two days after they left California, it started to rain. And as they started going up the mountains, the rain turned into snow. So they got about 12 miles from the summit and they couldn't go any farther. So they had to basically take the food that they had brought, like all the sh shit that they would brought for their families and whatnot. They had to cache them, like, like kind of stow them uh, in Bear Valley. Then they had to go like backtrack back to California and hoping that they could like get more people to come with them and get more supplies, you know, so they could get back out and rescue their families. Now, the problem was that at this stage, uh, the Mexican War had started up. So a lot of able-bodied men in the area had gone to fight in that. So there weren't like a lot of, you know, just stray dudes around that you could kind of like send out on a rescue mission to the fucking snow-covered Sierra Nevada mountains to save your wife and children. So they thought, they're like, okay, well, when we left the party, they still had uh, some cattle left, so they probably have enough meat to get through the winter. But that was not the case. Uh, it seemed that a lot of the cattle had already been, uh, had either died, run off, or been consumed. November 29th, uh, the settlers at Donner Lake killed the last of their oxen for food. Mm. The day after they did that, five more feet of snow fell onto their camp and they're like okay well we're not getting out of here at this stage uh all of their animals pretty much were gone uh like i said they'd either been eaten or they had wandered off into the snow and died um they had killed all their cattle and they had resorted to eating uh pretty much any if they had any like leather they would just boil it and eat it. They started eating twigs. I wonder why they did that. I guess they didn't know any better. There's no nutrition in that. Well, the men None. started hunting, but they couldn't yeah. really find anything. I guess right. like this. Like I said, this was one of the worst winters right. on record. Like there no, was I'm talking about winter. the leather. Yeah. I mean, there's no nutrition in leather. I mean, well, they figured. Well, it was once like animal skin, so maybe yeah. there's some there's kind none. of. There's not, but they didn't. It's a waste know. of time. It's better than not eating anything. I uh, guess was I don't their know. thinking. That's what they're thinking was. Because you're eating fucking clothing. Although it's probably the clothing of the dead. But there, there's still no nutrition in it. Well, yeah. But None. like I said, they wouldn't know that. They were right, just yeah. like, look, anything they could eat right. would be something. Mm. Better than nothing. That's that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. December 15th, a dude in the party named Bayless Williams died of malnutrition. And... They figured, okay, at this point, like, they didn't get to the point where they're like, hey, we should eat that dude yet. However, that dude dying of malnutrition did kind of light a fire under their asses. So they got together a party. Uh, it was five men, nine women, and one child. And they made some kind of, like, crude snowshoes. And they said, okay, we're going to go out and we're going to walk the hundred miles to Sutter's Fort and we will bring a rescue party back here. This rescue party was called the Forlorn Hope. Mm. Is that sad? <laughs> so like so they fucking all right. So they put on snowshoes and they set out on foot in the snow for a hundred mile journey. Oh, they shit. were like f desperate at this stage. I mean this is pretty badass, you have to think. It's like they they didn't have any other choice, really. So they set out with a little... They had, like, some food rations and stuff like that. However, they were only out for six days, and then their food ran out. For the next three days, they just starved. Uh, you know, and like I said, these are, like... You have to think the Donner Party endured, I believe it was six blizzards Damn. on their fucking journey. Damn. Like I said, nature hates you. Yeah. So, yeah. So three days, nobody eats. Um, Charles Stanton, who was on this party, uh, he was not able to keep up with the party and like told them to go ahead. Now, one problem, too, that I think a lot of people don't. I mean, not only were they starving and like the fucking conditions were horrible because you have to think they had snowshoes, but the snow was so deep that every time you took a step, your foot would go all the way down to the snow and you had to bring it all the way back up. And you hadn't eaten 
anything except right. like f- shoes and shit so you didn't have like any energy yeah so the just the energy of like having to bring your foot up like every single step you took was just like really really exhausting and another thing too was that and this is something that isn't addressed much is snow blindness and i don't think that people back then knew what snow blindness was it's basically the ultraviolet rays like bouncing off the snow damage your eyeballs and if you're out in it long enough you will actually go blind permanently (laughs) yeah fry your fucking eyeball yeah is basically what it does um but in the short term it really does like fuck your eyes up and you can't really see where you're going i mean not to mention too that it's like it's just white everywhere and you can't really tell what direction you're going in so charles stanton falls behind the rest of the group keeps on walking. However, a couple days after that, yet another blizzard hits them and they couldn't keep a fire lit. They couldn't like keep going. Um, several of the party died, including uh, a Mexican guy that had been with him who was named Antonio. Nobody knew what his last name was, sadly. Uh, Irish dude named Patrick Dolan, uh, Franklin Graves, and a dude named Lemuel Murphy. Uh, they all died and the rest of the party ended up having to eat them. Yep. As you would. So by the time, so they actually did end up having to eat the people that had died. By the time they got to the Western side of the mountains on January 19th, 1847, there were only seven of them left. Mm. Only two of the 10 men survived. Uh, William Eddy and William Foster were the only dudes that survived. All five women lived. Hmm. I don't know why. I just maybe because women women have higher fat content. We can we can starve longer. Maybe they were fed more. Yeah, people it might've, might be trying to defend the women and children. I, yeah, that might have been a factor also. Right. Uh, women do have like higher fat content too, so it's like they might like, last longer in that situation too. Maybe but. they didn't do as much physical exertion. The men were doing most of the work. The women um, were, being, were just walking. not from anything I read. It's like pretty yeah. much everybody was doing the same shit. It seems walking. Like. Well, yeah, that's all they were yeah. doing is like walking. Yeah. No one was hunting. No one was doing anything like that. It was just walking in snowshoes. Yeah. They were just trying to get. To California so they could get supplies and get people to come back and like get up a rescue party to like help everybody. So of the eight people who died on this particular forlorn hope journey, uh, seven of them had been cannibalized. Mm. Uh, eat. Now they uh, actually sent out a bunch of, they, they did get to uh, like an outpost where they could send out messages and say, Hey, look, there's like all these other people and they're stranded. Like, and they said where they were. It's like, can we please get up like a rescue party to go and help them? So they actually were successful in doing that. February 5th, uh, the first relief party, which was seven men, they left a ranch called Johnson's Ranch. uh, And then there was a second party, which was headed by James Reed, who would, uh, you know, was the first guy that organized the Donner Party. And uh, they left two days later. Now, February 19th, the first relief party gets to the lake where the Donner party had been camping. They get there and they thought everyone was dead because everything was just covered with snow. There was like, there was just like cabins and it was just like desolate. And they were like, just creeped out and they're like, Oh shit. Like everybody's dead. And then this one creepy woman like comes out of the fucking snow. And she says to them, She said something to the effect of like, are you men from California or are you from heaven? That's what she said. Damn. Yeah, she was, they said she looked like a ghost, like coming out of the shit. Uh, So at this point, uh, 12 of the party that they had come back to rescue were dead. Hmm. Uh, 48 were left. However, many of them were very, very ill, uh, were barely alive or had gone completely mental because of hunger right now so the relief party had got to them but they couldn't take all of them at once i mean there was still 48 of them so they couldn't like take them all out at once and they couldn't bring that much food back to them because the relief party was small so the first part relief party uh they got actually 23 of the refugees and you know were able to get them out of there However, while they were going back 
to California, two of the peop- two of the children in that group uh, passed away. Um, now, while the first relief party was going down the mountain, the second relief party was coming up the mountain. So finally, James Reed got to see his family members because they had been, they were some of the refugees that were coming down with the first relief party. So he actually got to see, it had been like four or five months since he had seen them. Damn. So he was like reunited with his family at that point, which was kind of nice, even though that guy was kind of a douche. So March 1st, the second relief party gets to the lake and finds that so many people are dead and so many people have been eating each other. Damn. Um, yeah. So they get to Alder Creek where a lot of the camps were, find that the Donners had also resorted to cannibalism. March 3rd, uh, James Reed left the camp with 17 of the emigrants. Just two days after that, though, like he was trying to rescue them and then there was, guess what? Another blizzard. Damn. Because nature hates you. So by the time that blizzard had passed, Isaac Donner, a member of the Donner family, had died. And most of the refugees that he had picked up, the 17 of them, couldn't really travel anymore because they were too weak. They were too hungry. James Reed and another guy named Hiram Miller, they took three of the refugees with them and they said, okay, well, we'll go up and we stored some food over here, like during our last like trek. So maybe we can find that. Uh, the rest of the rest of them stayed behind at this camp, which ended up being called the starved camp, which because everyone was starving, you know, March 12th, there was a third relief group. This was led by William Eddy and William Foster, who were the pretty much the two men that survived from the uh, first foray. They got to starved camp. Uh, Mrs. Graves and her son Franklin were dead by this point. Uh, Their bodies and the body of Isaac Donner, who had died earlier, had been eaten. Mm. Uh, The following day, they get to the lake camp. Uh, Both of their sons were dead. March 14th, they arrived at the Alder Creek camp to find George Donner uh, was dying from an infection from that hand when he was trying to fix the wagon wheel. Yep. That ended up killing him. Yeah. His wife... Uh, and that was, t- what, six months before? Uh, it was a couple of months before, yeah. Okay. Like it trying ended, to get the, get, get the time right. Him. Yeah. Six or two? It wasn't... Yeah, it wasn't... I don't think it was six months, but okay. it was like a couple of months, yeah. All right. Uh, so George's wife, Tamzine, who was actually, I believe, his second wife, third wife, something like that. Um, she was actually still in fairly good shape, but... He was dying, but she wouldn't leave him. So she basically, they, they had three daughters together. And she sent her daughters with the rescue group. She said, no, just take them. I'm, I'm not leaving him. She wouldn't leave her husband. Uh, you know, which is kind of nice, but, you know, didn't end up so well. So uh, the relief party leaves uh, with her daughters and uh, a couple more members of the party. They left behind ones that were too weak to travel. Two of the rescuers, uh, Jean-Baptiste Trudeau and Nicholas Clark, they got left behind to care for the Donner party. But soon they were just like, I guess because they were so sick and they were dying, they were just like, fuck that. And then they left and then like caught up with the fucking party that was leaving. So a fourth rescue party gets sent out in late March, but they got stranded in yet another snowstorm for several days. April 17th, this relief party reached the camp and found only Louis Kesseberg alive among the mutilated remains of his former companions. Damn. He was eating them all. Well, he was the only one left. Like, right. a lot of people had died. There, there wasn't, like, a lot of... I don't know... Like, there was one documented murder, okay? He James Reed did yeah, murder yeah. that guy. But it did seem like most people were just dying and people were eating them because they were desperate. It wasn't yeah. kind of like a thing where, hey, let's kill people. And it right. seemed like these were good people who just kind of like had to resort to that because they didn't know what else to do. They were going to die otherwise. So it, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't an Alfred Packer situation where he's just like, I'm just going to kill him and eat him but just because. Right. These people really did not want to eat because there were some, you know, there were some accounts that when they actually did have to cut up and eat the people, they would like, 
they would go to separate fires so that you wouldn't have to eat your own relatives. Right, right. You know what I mean? And they would like immediately like cut off the heads and stuff like so, you, so they weren't recognizable. Yeah. Like they would They're do kind of depersonal. The yeah, they so. would do like shit like that. And they and they did seem to take great pains even though they were starving to be like, "Hey, that's not cool to like make a mom eat their own daughter or right. make, you know what I mean?" So they did seem to like still hew to that even in these desperate circumstances i think a little bit of that went by the wayside like later on as everyone was like starving to death but they did really seem to try to like adhere to some kind of like because that's pretty fucked up like having to eat your own fucking family members right even though at at some stage or so so i've read um it got to a point where some of the people that were dying were basically saying to their kids hey once i die go ahead and eat me it's okay well it's like that in tribal society yeah which you you can understand i mean like you know if your kid was gonna die if they didn't eat you i mean any parent you would think would say the same thing yeah i mean there's a lot of tribal societies you know they had ritualistic cannibalism when somebody died it was a gift back to the family of a good meal you know, which is a trip, but there were some. But it's understandable. In certain you tribal understand that. situations, there wasn't a lot of meat. You know what I mean? That yeah. was something that was kind of hard earned. So, you know, yeah, I get it. Well, and if you watch, there's a really good, um, uh, you know, the, the channel, the, uh, uh, Ask a Mortician. She did like about a half hour show about the Donner Party. She went to like the, um, you know, the, the state park and everything where all the memorials are and stuff. And she kind of talked about, because, you know, she's a mortician, so she talks a lot about, like, funerary practices and stuff. So she does actually talk about the distinctions between different types of Mm -hmm. cannibalism. And she does go a little little bit into, uh, you know, tribes that... Ritual that it's kind of like a ritualistic or, like, a sacred type of thing. where It's not, like, offensive. It's just, like, you're, you're absorbing their power, like, into yourself. Or you're, like making them live forever because you're eating them and there they're was like also, becoming part of your body. There's also a warrior cannibalism. Yeah. Very, yeah, she made that distinction. You know, very common in Africa. But I think um, I think it happened also fucking probably in Europe too over the times, you know. You, you kill a motherfucker because he's a badass, you might as well eat him. Yeah. You know. Well, free meat. It's free meat and maybe you can absorb some of his badassery. Yeah. That was the thinking behind it. Well, and you but can totally a, understand that. It too. comes from poverty, though, when you really get down to it. Yeah. That you don't have anything. I mean, that you got to fucking maximize efficiency. Nothing goes to waste. I mean, and there is... You can understand, like, why there is um, a natural, yeah. you know, disinclination toward cannibalism for a reason. Yeah. Um, but in desperate circumstances yeah. or in certain ceremonial cer- circumstances, it does occur. Wouldn't surprise me that like in ancient European battle, probably around Russia and Middle East, you know, excuse me, not Middle East, but uh, Eastern Europe, back in the, you know, 1200s, 1100s, 1400s, there's probably a lot of that. Because, you know, they didn't get much to eat back in those days. And some of those battlefields had fucking several hundred dudes dying on both sides. And after the fucking battle, there's all these dead bodies laying around. You know, are you going to let that go to waste when your army hasn't been feeding you? It wouldn't surprise me. Even That's back, what I mean. In desperate situations, right. you're kind of like, well, it's terrible, but meat is meat. Even some of the, even in the Napoleonic Wars. Yeah. You know what I mean? Where, there, where Napoleon's invading Russia. Those dudes were fucking desperate. It would not surprise me that if fucking battlefield meat was 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 rendered yeah you know what i'm talking about why I mean, wouldn't you that's why it's like it's kind of a shame that i mean i don't know if it's a shame but like the donner party are just known for the cannibalism but anybody that was in that situation yeah. you would do the same thing you're trying to stay alive you're trying to keep your family alive your children alive i mean obviously yeah. if people are just dying of other shit you know yeah. why not 
eat them. Right. It's like, it, you know what I mean? It just seems like... There's no supply chain. There's it's no other, terrible, but... There's no other choice. There's I no mean, other food. Right. Practical concerns. Right. It's and it really practical. does seem like... I mean, nobody got charged with murder or anything like that. Like I said, the only person, as far as I know, that murdered anybody was James Reed who stabbed it's that It's not dude. like you could just go up the street to the Circle K. Right. And get a Hot Pocket. You know what I mean? Those days, those days weren't there. Get a hot pocket. Let's go get a hot pocket. You know, that that shit's not there. It's a human hot pocket. Yeah, human flavor. Right. But yeah, it's like that's the thing. It's like so I don't really blame them because, really, it seems like they had exhausted all of their. Yes, they made a couple of dumb decisions, but like I said, it wasn't entirely their fault because they were given some really bad advice, and it really does seem like they ended up in this situation and they didn't really have any other choice. And they exhausted all of their other options. I mean, they had already eaten all their oxen. They had eaten yeah. their fucking shoes and clothes and fucking roofs. And that was a long, terrible journey. Yeah, and they had eaten all the... They were fucking... <laughs> we're going to go out west to paradise. This is yeah. like the worst winter ever. Yeah. And they got stuck in it. And they didn't know what else to do. And people yeah. were dying. And they didn't kill them. The people just died of starvation yeah. or of exposure or whatever. So it's like, why not eat them yeah you know what i mean i was fucked up but it's like if you're in that situation what else are you gonna do like i said it's like the fucking uruguayan rugby team it's like right. they crashed in the fucking mountains yeah, they were from uruguay where th- those argentina I th- i'm pretty sure they were from was uruguay, uruguay? Okay. yeah but yeah they crashed in the mountains and they're like they didn't know if anybody was coming to rescue them or not it's like people were dead it's like we're Although gonna in starve. that situation all you had to do is just go down the mountain there was a road there but they didn't know they that. didn't know that though they weren't right. from there. They the from fucking there, yeah. plane crashed in the fucking yeah. mountains. For all they knew, they were just going out into the wilderness. Yeah. But so it ended up, like, with all the rescue parties, because, like, rescue parties did go out there, like, to be fair. Um, it took four uh, rescue parties and two months uh, to rescue what was left of the Donner Party. Hmm. Now, like I said, uh, I it's weird because I learned about this in school and I always kind of, like, took away that they had all died, but they didn't. Um, two thirds of the men in the party died. Two thirds of the women and children lived. So all in all, 41 individuals dead, 46 lived out of the original party. Um, five had died before reaching the mountains. 35 perished at the mountain camps or trying to cross the mountains. One died just after getting to the valley. Uh, Even those that survived had various problems. Uh, Most of them had lost most of their toes because of frostbite and whatnot. So because uh, the story of the Donner Party was so uh, widespread, like, of course, the media had a fucking field day because cannibalism, everybody wants to read about that. You sell a lot of newspapers. It does. Um, Which, you know, that's understandable. Everybody wants to hear about cannibals. And I'm sure there was a lot of fake news mixed in with it, too. Well, probably. That's how they were back then and, and even today. Well, and I'm sure they probably, like, yeah. you know, ramped it up like, oh, they murdered each other and killed each yeah. other. That's not... Mothers eating their babies. Which, uh, yeah. that's not exactly what happened. It's yeah. like, yes, there was at least one murder. I'm not saying that there weren't more than that. But I do feel like most of this was just, like, the circumstances. And it was just, like, horrible circumstances. Yeah, but anybody would have done it. And I think anybody would have done the same thing if they wanted to stay alive. And particularly if they had a family that they were trying to keep alive also. They were pushed to the fucking limits. Yeah. I mean, this is, like, every, like I said, every horrible thing that could happen to these people happened to them. It's, like, not only were they fucking lost and they were in these horrible, like, but... Six blizzards, you guys. Six blizzards. They ran out of food. They didn't have the right fucking equipment. It's just like they didn't. They were stuck by this fucking lake. They couldn't get through this fucking pass. They didn't know where they were going. And it's just like, you know, what are you gonna do? You can't go to the fucking Seven Eleven and get a cup of coffee or nothing like that. It's just. So there's that, nothing there's nothing else you can do. Is that it? What else is in the well? Blizzard? Fairly okay. So okay. W- all I was gonna say was that after. After this story came out about the Donner Party, um, like emigration to California, uh, understandably decreased, decreased, <laughs> yeah, immensely because it yeah. was like fuck that shit. Fuck We're not that, doing. Yeah. I don't. We don't. We don't want to go there that bad. Um, so the Hastings cutoff, which was what had caused all of the heartache from the beginning, uh, people like largely forgot about it. However, 
1848, only a couple of years after the tragedy, somebody discovered gold at Sutter's Mill in Coloma, yeah. California, and suddenly the gold rush was on, and everybody started going out there again and forgot all about that shit. Well, yeah. they didn't forget about it, but it's just kind of yeah. like, fuck that, gold. Yeah, and the gold rush was the beginning of the Wild West as you know it from the fucking Hollywood viewpoint. Yeah. Point of view. That's when all that shit's fucking happened. Yeah. Yeah. And but, there wasn't much gold. That that was it was I mean, a, there it really was a meme. There was gold, but not that much. It seemed like there was enough for like individual prospectors to yeah. go there and like find enough to live on. But I didn't really see there there didn't really seem to be like that many people like going out there and becoming like fucking fabulously wealthy out of the shit. There like, you would some, go out there and you'd get, like, a living a, a yeah. living wage. Later on, there were some people that said that the whole there's gold and then there are hills effort was a government-backed fucking psyop to get people to go run west to, to help colonize the west. A lot of it had to do with, you know what I mean, fucking the, the Mexican-American War, too, to fill that fucking area. Well, as there I said... There may have not been... The whole reason yeah. that the, uh, you know, that the emigrants guide to Oregon and California, yeah. the whole reason that Hastings got pop, got famous and that book got famous, I mean, he was like working with a company in California that was trying to get people out there yeah. to sell land. So it might have been like some big private corporation yeah. that was trying to get more people to move there so yeah. they could sell plots of land, which was demonstrably the situation in this case i mean that's why he was trying to get and yeah. that's why he promoted in his book hey i've got this shortcut that he had never even fucking done yeah. and then when he tried to do it the same time that the donner party was doing it he was like oh yeah no this is not working out he did live but he didn't take his shortcut you know what i mean yeah. like he took part of the shortcut and he's like oh yeah this isn't working and he told them but then like he just like went another way yeah, that's kind of like, uh, you know, a lot of people will fucking lay everything at the feet of the fucking American government. During this time, the American government was weak as shit. It really didn't have much power outside the fucking eastern seaboard. I mean, you hear nowadays all these stories about, well, you know, Americans giving out fucking smallpox blankets. Really, the first time that was ever mentioned in history was an idea that a British officer had of maybe doing against enemy Indians during the fucking French and Indian Wars over a fucking bunch of fur trading. And there's no evidence that that ever happened. It was just that an, in, an officer said, hey, maybe smallpox might help us. But there didn't seem to be any actual British attempt at waging like a smallpox war. Um, the... Shit was shit was so vague back then. You know what I mean? There isn't any evidence for anything. A lot of this shit is it's, just fucking rumor. Well, the thing about it is it's hard to tell because I don't think anyone back then would have had the presence of mind to realize that Native Americans did not have the same immunity to European-specific diseases. Yeah, that's later. So... Yeah. I'm not saying that they didn't give them blankets that were infested with diseases, but I don't know if they did it on, on purpose. purpose. Right. Um, it just kind of like happened because they didn't know anything. I better. remember reading that there's no evidence of that. Not from those days. I mean, I would be it's surprised if anybody of, back then had the presence of mind. Even think that about kind of that, shit. right. I don't think there was any kind of smallpox blanket. You know what I mean? Fucking... I mean, it wouldn't shock me because even in the Middle Ages, they knew enough about, quote-unquote, what we would yeah. call chemical warfare. Yeah, Nowadays, throwing people They would throw, like, plague bodies, like, over... over and like, and because shit. they knew that they would, like, right. you know, that it would infect the people inside. So they did have the presence of mind to do that. So it maybe is not that much outside of the realm of well, possibility. Well, what's outside of the realm of the possibility, though, is the American government doing it. I don't think they had the power or the I, fucking... Yeah, if it, it might have been were, on a small scale. If anybody were to do anything like that, it would be somebody like the railroad or a corporation. And back in those days... Yeah, that wouldn't shock me. Corporations back in those days were basically fucking their own nation states. They had nothing yeah. to do with any other countries. 
And matter of fact, a lot of them fucking were operating here in the United States outside the boundaries of the United States yeah. and outside of the boundaries of law. Which, but still, even they really didn't have their shit together. They Although weren't that it, fucking smart. To me, it would. It seems more probable that, that it they would be would do somebody it. like that. Right. Than, they, yeah. There may be somebody in a corporation somewhere might think of something would like that. Would think of that. Yeah, but, that sounds plausible. Uh, but uh, there's no evidence. The thing is, is no, there's not. I'm there's just no saying evidence. it sounds more plausible to yeah. me than some weird, like, go- like than a whole, government, like government. The government, the like. U.S. government during this area was during this era was weak. Well, especially like I said, out in the West, and which was they not, had no ability to project power. They didn't really yeah. have any jurisdiction in that area no. during this time period. It was very sketchy. See, I'm telling you guys, man. See Jeremiah Johnson. John Millius. <laughs> Fucking Jeremiah is out there trying to survive and the American army comes to ask him for help. You know what I mean? And you see how fucked up. You know, the, the American government was not a professional outfit in during this era era. Everything it was, was very ragtag. It was fucking ragtag bullshit and they didn't know what the fuck they were doing. Um everything was done just kind of like by the people that were local. And there's not a lot of records. It's Mad Max times. Well, and as I said, like looking uh, looking more into this Donner Party story, you can really see how I mean, so much of the shit that happened to them was because no one had ever taken this particular route before. They didn't have any way of knowing that this person that had written this supposedly authoritative book didn't know what he was talking about. So they didn't have any reason not to take his word for it that, oh, he'd found this better route out to California. Why shouldn't we take that? And... It's sad because that ended up killing yeah. half of their party in yeah. a really horrific way because they didn't and they didn't know anybody. These were not like dummies. They weren't yeah. like like I said these were settlers. They had done this shit before. They knew Yeah. you know the conditions they were going to be facing. They had like planned for 4 months on the uh, you know in the wagon train. They had stocked up for that shit, but it's like it's funny because most books about America and the American continent were written by people who had, didn't know what the fuck they were shit. talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't really until the internet age you were really kind of able I mean, to check shit. I have it like as much as as much as Hastings in this situation yeah. like sucked. At least I will give him enough credit that. Even though it, it, even though the Donner Party had already set out like following his advice, and that ended up very badly, but at least he did say, "Hey, maybe I should go check out this route that I've like given all these people, like in my book." And he did actually do it for a little while, and he did try to warn them, like he did go one way, and he's like, "Yeah, this is not such a good idea," and shit like that. But then he kind of pieced out. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? He knew he was wrong. Yeah, and it's like, maybe he was embarrassed. He got to that point, he's like, oh man, this is like even worse than I imagined. He was looking at a map made by somebody else, and he's writing about that. Yeah, that's exactly what he did. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what he did. Because he he didn't go on the route until after the book had come out, because he left on the route the same day that the Donner Party did. Yeah. And the book had already been out for a year or two by that point, as far as I can And there's remember. no way that map could have been a topographical map. Clearly, showing, it, clearly it was not. Showing where all the mountains were, no. where all the shit was. It was just a general shape on a piece of paper. And he's going, He oh, looked well. at a map and thought, oh, well, there's no mountains here in this, like, area. It's, like, Drawn all, by the guy that came yeah, before Yeah, it's, like, me. all drawn. Yeah. There's not... He didn't draw anything here. Yeah. So it must just be, like, fucking... Just cake. Walking through that shit. He's tripping. I walked over shit like that up in Korea. Fuck... <laughs> Nobody wants... Like I said, the shit that the Donner... <laughs> the poor fucking Donner Party, man. It's, like... You, you you think they're just like walking through the desert and shit. It wasn't. It, they were climbing mountains. Yeah. And they had eaten nothing. Yeah. They're that'd climbing mountains in like 20 feet of snow. Yeah, that'd be rough. Man. And they had wagons. Yeah. They had children mm. that they were trying to like fucking keep from dying. 
it's not a good situation. Yeah. So it, so what's up? I mean, like, what's is that? Is that? Can we wrap this up? What's the end of this story? Yeah. What happened well, to these people? Well, half of them died. Okay. And went into legend, and now okay. everybody remembers the Donner Party as those people that ended up having to eat each other. Yeah, they even show up on the fucking The Shining movie by Kubrick. They ate each other they up. They ate Yeah. <laughs> Said Danny, Tor- Danny Torrance. Some of them did. They did. Yeah. I forgot that like half of them actually did survive because yeah. they sent rescue parties in there. Like at there least was probably shit that was worse than that where none of them survived and we'll never hear about it. The reason yeah, because we don't even know where their bodies yeah, are. Yeah, the reason why we know about the story is because a lot of people survived. Yeah, which they, tells me that there was a lot of a lot worse shit that happened out there. And like I said, this this particular case, and I think that's one of the reasons that this has kind of gone gone down in like American history as like a very famous uh, story is because it was very well documented. It's like the people that survived like wrote extensive accounts of like what happened. Right. So we know pretty much what happened at every point right. along the journey because a lot of people did live. Yeah, which um, tells me that there were little parties of four and five people where a lot worse shit happened and oh, nobody sure. knows what happened because there was no documentation. Well, like I said, look at the Alfred Packer case where yeah. like this motherfucker goes off in the woods with five other dudes and yeah. like... Hits them all in the head with a hatchet and eats them. Uh, I'm sure that probably happened a lot back in the old days because there's not, like, much you could do about it. Just one guy walking alone, you know what I mean, for several months, fucking eating things as he goes. He ends up dying anyway. (laughs) Imagine that shit. (laughs) Frontier candy. Body never found. I just... For He's some reason, God, every time I think you. of like the Alfred Packer story, I yeah. just think of like Yosemite Sam, yeah, like walking through like a cartoon desert, and then yeah. like he just like eats a dude. <laughs> I don't know why I think of that, but well, yeah, all right. I gotta so go get the cat. You get yeah. You, I gotta get the cat. Pr- please go find the kitty. She like yeah. wandered off. Both of the kids, the the kitties wandered off somewhere. Yeah. All right, so uh, I think that will do it for episode 193. We hope told you, the story. Hope you guys have enjoyed this frontier cannibalism tale yeah for packer and the downer party this was a fun show actually yeah we'll see you guys next week <laughs> and for you regular people that listen to us all the time fucking like share subscribe and you will hear from us on flashbacks we do a flashback every fucking day sidetrack and sidetrack flashback i'm on acid <laughs> i'm fucking drunk are you i'm fucking give drunk. me no, some I'm on acid. no i wish i had some but <laughs> yeah I i'm too. drunk man i don't know what the fuck i'm talking about but no we do a fucking sidetrack every day we do and, so many shows now. Yeah, and the sidetracks are fun. Everybody seems to be enjoying them. We do the sidetrack show. Yeah. We do the matinee show, which is like new movie reviews. We yeah. do the old movie reviews. Talk about I do the, the I do the scary stories yeah. on Thursdays. Yep. Man, we do so many shows. I can't doing even a lot of shows it. now. Yeah, we but do. Uh, that's you know, all right, we'll just wrap this shit. We up. love we'll you guys. guys that's why let, let, that's why we do this shit. So uh, hopefully you guys have enjoyed episode 193 about frontier cannibalism uh tune in next time and remember if you like the show as he said like share subscribe if you'd like to financially support the show you can go to our patreon page patreon.com slash 13 o'clock podcast or you can go to our blog 13 o'clock podcast.wordpress.com and there's a button in the sidebar to a paypal account if you'd like to give a one-time donation we are also going to do a youtube membership which will probably have the same uh, perks as the Patreon thing yeah. where you can get like early access to videos and we'll whatnot. Get to it. So we will get around to doing that. I don't know how long it's going to take for YouTube to approve all the perks because they have to do that. But uh, we're working on that at the moment. So until next time, bye.